The sixth meeting of the 26th Council will come to order. All councilors are present this evening. Uh, we have a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance, and I, and I just want to ask us to uh, keep uh, um, in your thoughts and prayers and, uh, and, and dedicate this moment of silence to Justin Hare, State Police Officer Justin Hare, who was uh, killed on Saturday, and, and uh, remember his family and uh, to keep them in your, your thoughts and prayers during this time. Uh, and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Let the counselors, whoever would like to lead in English and then also in Spanish. Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the table near the chamber entrance. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting in person and on live streams through four different platforms, GovTV on Comcast Channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you can enable the closed captioning services on your television or device at this time. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the City Council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding videos online. Please call 7505-768-3100 for assistance during business hours Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. The Council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening, if needed. With regards to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks, and please no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are respectful of one another. All right, thank you. So we have several proclamations and presentations this evening. We'll start first with Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, actually, this evening we have um, some women from the Barrett Foundation. Corey Lee, who is the Executive Director, and Holly um, Durante, she's the Development Director. I think they're here. Hi, welcome in. If you guys can make your way to the podium. We'll get started on reading this proclamation, um, and I think we're going to get started with Councilor Bassan. <clears throat> Whereas National Women's History Month was established in 1987 as a way to celebrate women across the nation and their efforts to make the country and the world a better place for women of all ages and races, and whereas women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of Whereas women in the United States have been leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist, emancipation, industrial, labor, and civil rights and peace movement. And whereas in 2018, the city of Albuquerque created the Office of Equity and Inclusion, aimed at addressing racial disparities and achieve equity in local government, including gender equality. Whereas women play critical economic, cultural, and social roles in every sphere of life and constitute a significant portion of the labor force by working inside and outside of the home. And whereas women from all walks of life have served as early leaders at the forefront of every major progressive social change movement and Whereas the city of Albuquerque partners with local service providers like the Barrett Foundation that have a mission to end the experience of homelessness for women and children in our community by providing shelter, housing, and supportive services. And whereas in 2020, the Albuquerque City Council enacted an ordinance 
ensuring pay equity reporting requirements as a part of the city's procurement process and Whereas uh, the city of Albuquerque has not only taken on a variety of initiatives aimed at supporting women, but the community has a rich history of remarkable women leaders, entrepreneurs, um, business professionals, educators, and many more who have made significant contributions to ensuring the health, safety, and welfare of uh, women residing in our community. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby declares March 24th as Women's History Month and proclaims March 18th, uh, 2024 as International Women's Day. So thank you ladies for being here, I really appreciate it. I don't know if you wanted to say a couple of words, but before you do, I just wanna say that I think this is the most women that have served on city council in its history. I don't know if we have that information, but some tremendous leaders. <laughs> so. Thank you so much for your service and also thank you for honoring Barrett um, the women and the children of Barrett, thank you so much. And we look forward to continue serving women in Albuquerque for another 40 years. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a proclamation for you over here. We'll, we'll, we'll stand up and we'll say once again, thank you. No worries, that happens all the time. We're lagging here tonight. <laughs> all right, our next presentation um, is sponsored by Council Fuquan. Thank you, Mr. President. I have um, a proclamation recognizing justice for New Mexico's downwinders, and I'd like to um, ask the members of the Tula Rosa Basin Downwinders Consortium to come on down to the podium while I read the um, proclamation and then we'll give them a few minutes to talk. So, um, whereas the world's first atomic bomb was tested in New Mexico on July 16, 1945, and the U.S. conducted 1,038 atomic tests in the Nevada test site, 100 of which were above ground tests, and whereas in 1990 the U.S. passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act to pay restitution and medical care to people who were exposed to radiation from these nuclear tests, and whereas the U.S. government has been compensating these downwinders in other states, but the downwinders in New Mexico have never been included, although they were the first to be exposed to nuclear radio radioactivity via the Trinity atomic tests. And whereas there are some 500,000 people who lived within a 150-mile radius and as close as 12 miles from the Trinity test, and the radioactive fallout caused cancerous diseases such as le leukemia, multiple myeloma, and lymphomas, and whereas the RECA, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, is scheduled to expire on June 7, 2024, the current congressional bills to extend and expand RECA have been introduced, including Senate Bill 3853 that was passed, that's passed the Senate and the House Resolution 4426 that would include the downwinders of New Mexico for the first time. And whereas the U.S. has approved a $50 billion budget per year for the last 33 years, a total of $1,650 billion to maintain its current nuclear arsenals, but in that same period, less than 1% of that amount has been paid to those adversely affected by radioactive atomic tests. Be it proclaimed that the city, that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby proclaim support of the extension and expansion of the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act to include the people of New Mexico. And we have with us tonight, again, from the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium, we have Holly Beaumont, Bernice Gutierrez, Paul Pino, and Tina Cordova. Love to have you say a few words. Thank you so much, President Lewis and council members. Uh, my name is Tina Cordova, and those of us are, who are here tonight are steering committee members for the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. 
We're an organization that was founded 19 years ago to bring attention to the negative health effects suffered by the people of New Mexico as a result of being overexposed to radiation from the Trinity test. Everybody in New Mexico is a downwinder, and it's important that the city council has signed on to our work because people all over Albuquerque have suffered from cancers, and likely many of them have, have gotten cancer because they were overexposed to radiation from the Trinity test. And so we're grateful for your support, and um, we know that we're very close now. We just received a vote in the U.S. Senate of 69 to 30 in support of our bill. That never happens in the U.S. Senate these days. And so this is a bipartisan issue, and we need everybody to support our efforts. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. We needed uh, this from the City Council. Thank you, Ms. President, and I just want to thank the four of you for all the work you've done to raise awareness of this issue. I was really pleased last year when President Biden was here and he actually mentioned this in his speech. It was really nice to see the recognition that you deserve um, coming from the highest folks in our government. So thank you for all your work. Thank you for this. And come on around, shake our hands, and we'll get you the proclamation. I have one more presentation, Council Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that we rules be suspended for the purpose of allowing more than two proclamations this evening. Second. The motion is second. Anybody in discussion? Uh, those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Council Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. Today I have the honor of um, presenting a proclamation or city council to our members of our Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Commission. And I'd ask that those members come on up, please, to the podium while we read the proclamation. We have the Chair Teresa Garcia, Jody Jaramillo from our Rape Crisis Center. Um, chat, chat, yeah, sorry, <laughs> Appalot. We have Bonnie Escobar from Enlace. We have Jolene Holgate from Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women and Shannon Lowry from SANE. Thank you all for being here. Whereas Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Commission, DVSA Commission of the City of Albuquerque, has been steadfast in its commitment to addressing the critical issues of domestic violence and sexual assault within our community and... Whereas March 13th marks the first year anniversary of the DVSA Commission, signifying a milestone in its mission to foster prevention, intervention, and support services for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and... Whereas the DVSA Commission, comprising seven voting members and 14 advisory members, has tirelessly worked toward fostering an effective community-wide system of prevention and intervention that is responsive to the needs of survivors and... Whereas the DVS Commission is dedicated to addressing and decreasing the rate of domestic and sexual violence occurring in our community and... Whereas, according to the 2021 report by the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, the New Mexico lifetime rate of intimate partner violence among women was 37.6% and 33.3% among men. And? Whereas domestic violence affects, affects every community in New Mexico, a 2021 report by the New Mexico Coalition of Sexual Assault found there were 18,667 domestic violence incidents reported to statewide law enforcement agencies, Bernalillo County, uh, according to 14,000 of those reports, and... Whereas the DVSA Commission has acted as a vital forum for communication, education, and dialogue with Albuquerque residents and individuals involved with domestic violence and sexual assault issues, promoting clear understanding, current laws, and available resources in the community and whereas in its inaugural year the DVSA Commission has achieved significant milestones through collaborations with organizations including training programs for the Albuquerque Police Department DART team 
directing language and restraining orders to improve services for survivors. Additionally, the Commission has advocated for legislative initiatives, advocated for fundraising for domestic violence and sexual assault programs, and pioneered conversations with the District Attorney's Office to establish a domestic violence court. These efforts underscore the Commission's commitment to program collaboration, survivor advocacy, and continuous improvement. Be it proclaimed that the Council, the governing body of the City of Albuquerque, hereby recognizes the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Commission's commitment to survivors. Thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to recognize Beatriz Valencia, who is our, our staff a member on equity and inclusion that also serves on the task force. So thank you. Do you all want to say a couple words? Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, today marks a significant milestone for our commission as we celebrate one year of dedicated service to our community in addressing the critical issues of domestic violence and sexual assault. I am deeply honored and humbled to stand next to these amazing individuals reflecting the incredible journey that we have undertaken together over this past year. I want to take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt congratulations to each and one of these each one of these members um, and of you as well and the mayor's office for their unwavering commitments and tireless efforts and invaluable contributions to our cause. It is through the dedication and collaboration that we have achieved a remarkable progress in our mission to support survivors and advocate for change. And one of the most important aspects of our work has been the coordinated community response and collaboration among various programs and agencies in support of survivors. And I'm grateful for the support and collaboration of our advisors, ex officio members, and um, City Council and Mayor's Office, whose expertise and guidance have been instrumental in our success. And I just want to recognize Jody Jaramillo from the Rape Crisis Center of Central New Mexico, Bonnie um, from in, in Atlanta Comunitario, Cherie from New Mexico Asian Families, Jolene from the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. We also have, as you mentioned, Beatriz from the City of Albuquerque Equity and Inclusion. We have Ellen um, from the City from homeless, Homelessness. She just changed her title. Well, I didn't. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the Department of Health, yes. Housing, and Homelessness. Yes, thank you. It's a long, long name. And then also our newest member, Ron S. from the ARC in New Mexico, and also various members that joined our commission meeting. We just finished it um, a little while ago, so thank you for your grace, and thank you for your support. It's been super instrumental, and yeah, just want to say thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, these flowers are for you. And also, also have to mention Isis Royball, who is the staff member who usually has helped with this commission as yes. well, who couldn't make it today. Yes, Isis has been <clears throat> That's all of our proclamations. I did want to mention uh, congratulations to the uh, University of New Mexico men's basketball team, the Lobos, for their win. Big win on Saturday night at the uh, uh, Mountain West Championship, and then we'll see them in the NCAA tournament. So we're excited about that. We'll congratulate them. Uh, we move on to some present. We have a few uh, uh, brief presentations tonight, uh, starting first with Councilor Brisson. Mr. President, I had recently had the opportunity to speak with Shauna Castle, who's the president and CEO with Goodwill Industries. If you want to start making your way over to the podium, please, Ms. Castle. And I know that I, I believe originally the plan was 10 minutes and then it got whittled down to five. So she has it down to eight and she's going to try to be really quick and efficient. But I always thought Goodwill was somewhere where you donate items and then they sell them and so I always thought well I'm not going to donate my items there because they're just going to sell them I can donate it to somebody who's going to donate and I learned otherwise uh, I was educated greatly on that and I think that it's very beneficial and important 
for more people to learn what Goodwill, Goodwill is up to, whether it be here locally in Albuquerque, but also the state of New Mexico. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to invite Shauna Castle to share a little bit of what Goodwill really is all about. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bassan, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you this evening. Um, so like Councillor Bassan said, everyone knows Goodwill uh, for our thrift stores, but very few people understand the scope of work that we do or the impact that we have on the community. For 83 years, we have dedicated ourselves to transforming lives through the power of work. And at Goodwill, we're on a mission to provide skills training, job development, and social services to New Mexicans. We are a local nonprofit, and the revenue that is generated in our thrift stores from the items generously donated by the community is what funds our programs and services, which we provide free of charge. I wanted to start just by highlighting a few facts for you. Um, the first one is that we are a large nonprofit employer. We have over 430 employees and anticipate having 470 employees by the end of this year. We spend approximately 1.5 million each month on payroll and have an economic impact of $36 million a year on the state. In addition to the social and economic impact we have, we're also proud of our impact on the environment and our commitment to sustainability. Last year, through our recycling efforts, we kept over 9 million pounds out of the landfill, and that number does not include what we sold in our stores. In addition, this year, with the help of the state and a grant, we were able to introduce two electric zero emission tractors, which further reduces our carbon emissions and enhances our other sustainability efforts that we have in place. We have 18 locations across the state, and we provide services in all 33 counties. And the revenue from every item that is donated stays in New Mexico, supporting New Mexicans. So now let's get to the heart of what we do. So last year, we served over 21,000 individuals through our programs and services, and we placed 1,556 individuals into employment in the community, meaning they were employed by local businesses, not Goodwill. This is the impact in just one year. So if you calculate that over the last three years, Goodwill has served over 51,000 individuals and placed 4,300 4, into community employment. Our programs are tailored to meet the evolving needs of our community, focusing on meeting our clients where they're at. Every program that we have has the eventual outcome of helping the individual find employment because we can see the dignity, purpose, and hope that a job gives someone. I don't have time to cover all 10 of our programs, but I just wanted to highlight a few and I will keep this short. But next steps is our reentry program, which we provide continuous service beginning 90 days pre-release from incarceration. We provide case management, employment training, job development, and specific assistance and ensure they have the resources they need when they are released. This way they have a support system providing them hope and work so their propensity to reoffend is reduced. We also have our Good Jobs program, which is our employment services program with the goal of finding community-based employment. This program provides one-on-one -on -one support for, from trained career specialists, including resume support, interview training, and career navigation. This program goes hand-in-hand -hand with our Good Skills program, which provides training in a variety of competencies, including digital literacy, life skills, professional development, and soft skills. And then we also have three veterans programs. Our SSVF program works to provide rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention. We provide temporary financial assistance to ensure veterans have stable housing as well as wraparound case management services. In addition, our HVRP program provides employment, job development, and case management services to veterans who are homeless or at the risk of homelessness. And then our VFS program, which provides wraparound case management for house veterans and their family members, providing a holistic approach to ensure the entire family is taken care of. I just want to share a very quick um, um, success story from one of our clients that really exemplifies our mission, and it's in their words. Where to start? Mine has been a journey that most would not have survived. I grew up in Santa Fe and got my bachelor's in communication from New Mexico State. I worked various jobs, including retail, and was with the city and county in various office positions. When I was 36, I decided to join the Army. Four years later, I was discharged, and I really struggled to engage the society, re engage in society. I became homeless, and I lost my family in 2012. I eventually got stable housing with LifeLink. 
I was stably housed for about five years, but then lost that housing. I was then connected with the Supportive Services for Veterans Family Program with Goodwill. I now have overcome alcoholism, drug addiction, homelessness, and cancer. I'm grounded now and feel much safer being part of the Goodwill program. They helped me with housing and getting work. My life is so much better. I feel like the SSVF program at Goodwill saved my life. Like many organizations, we face challenges. The revenue that is generated in our thrift stores is used to fund our programs and services, but it's not enough. With increased wages, benefits, capital improvements, repairs, and just the costs of running an organization day to day, it's becoming harder and harder, and you can only sell a used shirt for so much. So we appreciate the support of the community, the council, and the city to be able to continue to provide the robust services that our community so greatly needs. So what's on her, our horizon? We are rolling out a mobile unit that is equipped with technology and resources to meet our clients literally where they're at. So whether that's under a bridge, um, in a parking lot, in the west side shelter, or in a rural area, we will be there. We're also looking at turning our San Mateo facility into a state-of-the-art training center for anyone in the community to access it. It has, we'll have free classes, computers, resources, and services will be offered, and we hope to extend those services to include expungement services. And then finally, in our continuous effort to innovate and lead in the sustainable, develop, sustainable development area, I'm excited to share our latest initiative, which is the Clean Tech Training Program. This pro program will provide an opportunity for individuals to complete an eight-week accelerated paid training course in solar installation and troubleshooting with no more education than a GED. This initiative not only aligns with our mission, but also supports the city's goals for environmental sustainability and growth. It's about creating a future where both our community and our planet can thrive, and we are currently looking for assistance to complete this initiative. As one of our clients, Ken, said, this has completely changed my life. To be honest, I think I might have given up completely without goodwill. I still can't believe what they did for me. Thank you for listening and for the opportunity to share the amazing work that happens each and every day because of our remarkable staff. And with your support, we can continue to empower individuals through employment, education, training, building a stronger, more sustainable community for generations to come. Thank you. Mr. President and Ms. Castle, thank you so much for your presentation. It, was, it, it truly is enlightening, and that's a lot to hear in just a few minutes. Uh, but I really hope that you know, the counselors will reach out to Ms. Castle, the administration. It, it's one, Goodwill is one of many nonprofits. It's not just the only one, and I'm not trying to highlight and pick favorites, but this is where when we learn what we didn't know we didn't know, I think that I'm hoping that the city of Albuquerque can help lean on some of the nonprofits that actually are walking the walk rather than us trying to reinvent a wheel or us trying to just kind of pivot on our own. There are organizations and nonprofits out there doing the job. And so I really hope that we reach out to some of these, including Goodwill, and we, and we figure out how to leverage and really help the city of Albuquerque through some of the problems we have with addiction and homelessness and education and training and connectivity. And so I think that it's very enlightening and I'm very excited to know more about it. So thank you very much for what you said. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, just one moment, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Just had a quick comment. Thank you for coming in and, and um, sharing all that you do with our council and also all the people that are here and with our city. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to make sure is where do we go to make sure that we send people to the right place? Um, what's your contact information? How do we get people to you? I appreciate the question, Councillor Sanchez. Um, you can visit our website at goodwillnm.org for all of our locations. And our model is for each of our stores. We try to provide services out of it. I have the pleasure of um, touring Ms. Uh, Councillor Grout at our newest location, which is on Copper. But for any of our stores, you can walk in, ask for help, and we will be able to direct you, whether it's um, at that specific store or another location. Again, we try to meet clients where they're at. Thank you very much. Thank and I'm you. not sure if everybody caught that, but you could walk any, into any Goodwill store, and the people there will help you out. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Councillor Pena? Thank you, um, Mrs. Vice President. Um, 
So I had a quick question, just because you're here, so I'm glad you're here. I'm really encouraged to know that you're working with veterans. You used to work with the de um, developmentally disabled community. So what shifted from the mission? Why did you guys decide to, to go on that route, just out of curiosity? Absolutely. So part of the reason that we shifted is because there's other organizations that provide that service better to that particular uh, community. And so it's about um, making sure that you are providing the right sources to individuals that need them. And there are other people that are experts in that space, um, including uh, ARCA and Adelante. And we don't want to duplicate services. That's really important. It's providing the services that we're experts in when it comes to employment. And Madam Vice President, so um, just a quick question. So do you hire lots of the veterans that you provide the services for? Absolutely. Are, are so you... we, we hire veterans. We are also um, a second chance employer, so we will hire individuals that are coming out of the prison system. We're sometimes the first place that they can start before somebody else will even give them a chance. Madam Vice President, so based on your um, 430 employees, how many of them are veterans? Um, I don't have a specific count off the top of my head, but I would be happy to provide that to you. If you can get that for Absolutely. us, and then if you don't mind me asking, I know this is an annual report question, but what's your indirect cost? Um, again, I will have to get that information for you. I don't have that okay. off the top of my head. Okay, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I did have the pleasure of, of um, touring your most recent opening, and I am very impressed with the organization. Um, the staff, what you all do there, um, there are, it's very com uh, comfortable, it's very inviting, and um, you do, are, you are really feeling a need in our community, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You and your staff, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next presentation, Counselor Baca. Madam Vice President, thank you. This is a presentation from Ralph Gonzalez, Director of Student Support, and Athena Sedano, Project Teacher and Advisor, to provide information about ACE Leadership Charter and student uh, comment, public comment. Uh, as folks may remember, several months back, Ms. Sedano requested her students have the opportunity to speak to council. And I'm a believer that anytime we have the opportunity to engage our youth in civic discourse, we really are doing uh, good things. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Sedano for her time and effort, as, as a former educator, I know just how much work it takes outside of a classroom to put these together, get prepare her students, and, and just create these enriching experiences for them. So uh, if we can keep this to the, the typical two-minute uh, public comment period. And Outstanding. Thank you. I'll just introduce myself. My name is Ralph Gonzalez. I'm the director of uh, student support at Ace Leadership High School. I want to thank you guys for uh, letting us speak tonight. Uh, we're a school that focuses on architecture, construction, and engineering. We focus on the trades and hands-on education for our students. And uh, after that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to the professionals, Ms. Serrano okay. and our you. students. Hello, President and Counselors. Thank you for allowing these young people to speak their minds. A special thank you to Counselor Baca for coming to our final exhibitions at ACE and offering this time at the start of City Council to speak. He listened, judged, and asked questions to our students regarding their floor plans that aim to reduce recidivism in prisons. You will hear some students speak about that today. Um, it was an honor to have you visit. Thank you. Public comment can run late in the meeting, and I have seen people leave before speaking their mind. It is inspiring to see direct action from Councilor Baca to request to move public comment to an earlier time to allow for more people, including these younger people, to share their thoughts. I would also like to thank the students that are about to speak, Gabe Gilbert. Lexi Garcia, Carlos Sandoval, and Toby Parrish. We have spent time learning about activists in class and how they use their voice. You are doing that now. You guys are inspiring. Um, I hope to hear other young people um, are motivated to come and speak their voice and ideas and concerns to City Hall. Thank you for your time and preparation. It can be daunting to speak in front of a panel and a group of people. I admire your guys' bravery. I hope you feel empowered as you come to the microphone. Your voice matters. So we'll go ahead and get started. Everybody is under two minutes, and one person wasn't able to come, so there should be plenty of extra time. Um, let's go ahead and have Toby Parrish come on up. Hello, counselors. Um, I'm Toby. I'm with ACE Leadership. Um, I'm a freshman, um, and I want to talk about the treatment of juveniles in juvenile detention centers here in New Mexico. 
Our goal should be to help them re-enter society and re reduce recidivism as they grow older. One of the main uh, causes of uh, being incarcerated is lack of education, and that is sadly a big issue here in New Mexico. We are one of the least educated states, and we need better education, not just for people in juvenile detention centers and in prisons and jails, but in general, we need better education. Within juvenile detention centers, we need better mental health treatment services. I myself have been someone who has gone through the mental health system here in New Mexico, and it is not great. Um, there isn't enough, sadly, not, not enough doctors and psychiatrists to help um, people who need it. And um, those who do get in, it takes months. It really does take waiting on a list and not being able to get the help you need. Um, I hope that in the future we can see um, more progress with mental health treatment and uh, what we do to help um, teens who are struggling with um, in and out of juvenile detention centers um, a different way to help them. Thank you. Uh, hi. My name is Carlos Sandoval. I'm a sophomore at Ace Leadership High School. And um, I'm here to talk about how we can we reduce recidivism in not only Albuquerque, but the United States alone. Um, a big problem uh, with our mainly juvenile incarceration systems is, again, the lack of education. So a big thing is a lot of us go in at eight, young ages, and once we get out, we don't know how to co um, live in the normal society. And then for a lot of people, uh, just we're just used to that go in the incarcerations. So once we come out, we're not used to it, and we just think it's easier to go back in, when, which most of us do. And that's one of the leading causes and recidivism. And I think a, a big thing that would help is um, better education, especially in the juvenile incarceration systems. Because uh, I have friends who have been through it, and I know people who ha are going through it uh, to this day. And I think it's a pretty big, touching topic that should definitely be looked into. And uh, I, th uh, I feel once, and like for the, like prison, prison, um, something we thought about for the redesign is to make it more of a college campus to mimic society. So that way, once they get out, it's. They're, they're used to it and they're not, they don't feel forced to go back in and they don't feel like they're not wanted. And teach them jobs that really don't care if, you're, if you have that uh, uh, bell in history. Uh, that's all I gotta say. Um, hi, my name is Alexis Garcia. I'm a junior at East Leadership High School. Um, I'm here today to talk about rehabs. Um, I believe that we need more funding going towards our rehabs. Um, I've spoken with um, a couple of locations around New Mexico um, of different rehabs, and most of their recovery rates was only 4%. Um, I believe that we need more resources in our rehabilitation centers, as well as um, mental health help for the patients. Um, it is understood that you cannot help somebody that does not want to be helped, but sometimes I believe that everybody needs um, some extra help and support from their loved ones especially um, to do better things and make better choices. Um, this is something that doesn't just affect the person under the influence, it affects their family members, um, the people closest to them, the people that care about them most. Um, and I think another thing we all have to remember a lot of the time that these drug users start at a very young age. And as we all know, that messes with your um, brain development. And that could lead you from making good choices. So some people can't help themselves. Um, there is at least one person in an addict's life that wants to help their loved one, but they can't because they're over the age of 18. Um, 
I believe that we should make it to where if a family member wants to help their other family member get into a rehab or get into other resources for help, like they should be able to um, before it leads to you losing your family member or them going into psychosis because um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but it's a very scary thing. Um, so I think that we need to stop treating these people who have a sickness, a disease, like as if they're criminals, sending them to jail, um, or acting like their lives don't matter as much as our do, ours do. Um, so I think we need to do more to get them the help that they need. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Gabe Gilbert and I am a junior and I am a high school. We're here to talk about you as the police officer. <coughs> so the long for the history, um, we um, punish for the, uh, the prisoning like a really bad stuff, like, um, uh, like treating them like really bad, like forcing them to do like, ask like, call them out, saying, Talk about um, for the police officer. We did not have like any to train. We have like rush. We didn't really understand how it's supposed to work. When did that goes? For anything things to do, and did not know how to like respond for things all that do. And for the another one. But the president are begging like to help and they're in like in the really hard we're danger we're in um dead we're things police sometimes they just don't be like sometimes like helpless helpless or hopeless or careless or things they have like issue to do with that sometimes like the police officers have like their health cares or didn't understand how it's supposed to work things how and sometimes they waited for more like six hours to let a person to die with things, really horrible things. And another one, and another one, sometimes police like use the drugs and the alcohol to make them feel better. It's because their life is a little bit more easier. It caused them to like be dizzy or be really, really forgotten all the things. So, we did not even know how like supposed to react or supposed to know or any destruction or things did not even happen. So all we could do and uh, in the future to help them to not use the drugs and alcohol again, not to treat really bad people ever again. We're things to like help them, we're here to support them, like truly care for things and yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. A few, few counselors, I think, want to. Few counselors, I think, want to make some comments. Of, uh, or, Councilor uh, Vice President Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would thank. I would like to thank you for bringing these fine young men and women to council tonight. Um, I have enjoyed listening to them, and I have listened to them. Um, their their um, thoughts are very valid, and we need to listen to them. Um, thank you for what you're teaching them and letting them, um, allowing them to be creative and think and, and try to solve some problems. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Really great to have you all uh, tonight. I can tell you have some great leadership there. Not only some great students, but some excellent leadership too. And it makes such a huge difference. So thank you. So that's our, uh, our presentations tonight. We'll move on to administration uh, Q&A period. Counselors, any questions for the administration? All right, uh, Counselor uh, Rogers and Counselor Sanchez. Sure. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just have a, a process question. Um, we're, I know several counselors um, and myself are getting calls from providers who received letters from different departments. So it looks like a new process that maybe we're doing about our budget. Um, but it's causing some confusion in the community and amongst our providers thinking that their funding is getting cut. Um, and I have a, probably four or five different um, departments that are sending these letters. 
So really the thing that is my question is in every single letter there's this paragraph. If you feel your organization can benefit from this funding or have agency justification for recurrence, please respond to this letter no letter than different dates from different departments. We are happy to review the request to determine if they are available if there are available funds to allocate in the FY25 budget. We also encourage you to share your agency justification and need to the sponsor or council member who allocated the FY24 funding. And so what this is causing is we're getting people saying, oh, the city's cutting our funding. What's happening? And can you sponsor this funding again when before, I understand because I wasn't here, but there, this was not a common practice. And so for me, it made me feel like we're saying to our providers, we may not fund you again, but call your city councilor because they can put it back in the budget. So just want to know what's the process, what's the process change that, prevent, that had these letters go out? And is that the message we're giving to our providers is we may not fund that, but check with your city councilors to sponsor this funding. Mr. President, Councilor um, Rogers, thank you for the question. Um, this year, we sent out letters to all of the uh, nonprofit partners that we work with that had non-recurring funding last year um, as a way for us to open up communication with all of them, give them an opportunity to not only tell us about uh, what the funding does for them that they have received, but if there are other needs or other opportunities for us to support them. Um, it actually resulted in great discussion um, with our departments, and I think with several of the counselors, we've had very good discussions about some of the areas where funding had potentially rolled over in past years and um, nobody realized who's, who was the sponsoring counselor. And so we've had funds in these fund not spent because the communication hadn't been there in the past. Our goal was to be proactive and give folks the opportunity to have not only an open door to communicate with the administration and the departments, which many of, uh, each one of them comes with a, a department attached to it, but also with their counselors, knowing that there are new counselors on the, uh, on, in this year as well. Um, from my opinion, it was a great way for us to open those doors. It was not by any means a threat by, to anyone. It, was, it is non-recurring in the budget is how those dollars are allocated. It comes from our non-recurring portion of the budget. It's so important for us to know about both the need and the opportunity. Uh, Councillor Vassal on the same issue. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Rogers, I just wanted to, when I was committee of the whole chair for, for a couple of years, I know the first year, I admittedly tried to wipe out almost every sponsorship because the city should not be a blank checkbook for nonprofits. Granted, we do try to help nonprofits, especially when they serve the needs of many active community members um, and the needs that we have for the priorities that we've set as a city. And I remember asking several councillors, you know, what is this sponsorship? Who does it, like, what is it serving? Who is the one that wants it in here? Because it is non-recurring. Every year, those organizations should count on zero dollars from the city. And for some reason, traditionally, I think that so many of these organizations have decided, no, the city always gives us this, so we're going to keep getting it. And that's, to me, not how it should work. They should seek other grant funding. They should seek, they should advocate for themselves. They should still work with the community, prove to the city, request with the city, and then we should be able to provide that funding to them. Um, and I think, in my opinion, as working as the committee of the whole chair, I think that it definitely seems like it became something that several, not all, um, different nonprofits would take for granted and just think like we've just got accustomed to always getting it. And suddenly when they're on the chopping block, they come running and we managed to find the funding. And I think it's as long as it's a good cause filling the needs of the city, but there's not a way to give every nonprofit funding. So to me, it's about advocacy, cooperation and coordination. Um, and in all fairness, I will advocate for certain nonprofits and try to get them in the budget because I think that they fill a certain need. But I certainly, I hope that all of the sponsorships out there that do receive money from the city of Albuquerque don't take that for granted and they don't just expect it to keep happening every year. No, I, I thank you, Mr. President, I, Councillor Rasan. I think that I, I appreciate that. I think some of the f things have gotten in the crosshairs, though, like our 768 help, um, the provider that does the 768 help where we have the signs posted everywhere. 
they're one of the people that received this letter and that potentially the 768 helpline could not be you know, refunded. So some of the programs that we rely on like that are, were in this group of, of letters as well. So I just, I didn't understand how we were differentiating between one of what you're saying, which is absolutely valid, but to want also one that we know we rely on a lot for the 76 help line um, was also also received one of these letters. And so I just didn't know how, if it was just all the nonprofits, regardless of the service that they provide to us, um, especially key services like the 768 help line. Thank you. And on this issue, Councillor Pena, Councillor Champagne, and then I believe on another issue, uh, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Just for some historical perspective, just want you to know that prior to this, I'm, I've been here since, since Barry, but um, the administration would always, um, there's probably like 40, 50 council sponsorships. Prior administrations would send it down, including this administration, they would send it down, and then we would have to kind of grapple over what we would fund here at the council. So to the credit of this administration, over several years now, they've actually been sending it down as part of the budget so that we don't have to um, have that dialogue amongst ourselves when there's limited resources and there's other priorities in, in the budget. So great job. And I did, as committee whole chair, I have been inundated with phone calls. And so I called as well to find out. I was like, what is going on? But I appreciate the extra effort that they did this year as to, as to what Councillor Bassan is talking about, is they really just really tried to find out whether these um, nonprofits were active or are interested in, in receiving these dollars and if they were to reach out to us. So I can see where you, where you see that, um, that kind of mix up. But I think you guys have had some healthy conversations. I have too with people you don't realize that, I didn't realize some of them were still um, getting money and this just, I think they created an application where they said, are, are you using the money? Are you filling out the application? Here are the necessary tools that you need to do. And when they come back to us, and like you're mentioning with the 768 number, I think that's important because if we um, make sure that there's um, measures in place for accountability, then it'll allow us the opportunity to say that the 768 should actually be part of the budget and shouldn't be in that um, framework of, um, of non-recurring funds. So um, that's what I had to add to that. So I hope that was helpful. Councilor Champagne. Yes, I just have one quick, how many letters went out? Do we know? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Champagne, I would be shooting in the dark somewhere north of uh, 90. I think, I mean, it's quite a bit. It's a big exact, list of just a, nonprofits yeah. across multiple different sizes and scales and scopes. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. All right, Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, last week, I asked uh, uh, Ms. Keith to provide me some information and reference uh, IPRA requests. And uh, now that I have it here, and I know you just recently sent me a note, so I'm not gonna ask you questions regarding the note that you just sent me. I'll give you some time to, to work on that. Um, but I'll, I'll just let the public know what the questions are. What I'm wanting to know is I'm wanting to know what the content of, of the IPRA requests are. We have 1.2 million, almost 1.3 million dollars worth of, of IPRA requests that were paid out. And uh, when we see this amount of money, as counselors, we need to be asking, you know, what's going on here? And I think it's important that the city uh, ends up providing an answer of why um, these zipper requests were denied or slow walked or an ex ex explanation as to what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I think it's important for us as counselors to know exactly what's happening with these IPRA payouts. We need to uh, find out if there is if there is some incompetence and in, in, in reference to some of the some of the uh, the directors or or what what the challenges are. So the question I have for you today is, which departments in the city are having challenges responding to IPRA? Uh, Council President, Council Sanchez, I think, as you know, IPRA is handled by the city clerk's office. It's centralized now. Um, so all responses go through the city clerk's office with the exception of some records that can be, or a few records that can be obtained directly from, from some departments. I was looking for the city clerk. Is he not here? I, I don't know if he's here. Okay. Maybe he could help um, us out a little bit. But uh, so to, to your point, uh, I can give you the more detailed information on each of those claims uh, shortly. I just 
Okay. I just, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, how can we help you get these zipper requests out? Um, you know, right now, from what I'm seeing, is this amount of IPRA requests that we're seeing here, um, and the long list, and this list is from January 1st to December 31st, which thank you for getting to me, but man, when you look at the list, you sit here wondering what's going on. So, um, like I said, is there any departments that you're having challenges um, that are responding to the IPRA request? And if so, why? Uh, thank you, Council President um, and Councilor Sanchez. I would say the reality of the IPRA today is we have more material at our fingertips than we can process in the time that the public perceives as reasonable. I mean, since the body-worn camera law went into effect several years ago, there are now routinely uh, incidents where we are processing more than 100 lapel camera videos. Um, every member of my staff is working on 100 to 120 IPRAs at any given time. We produce on probably five to 10 IPRAs per week. So that's per person, 40 IPRAs per month. And at that rate, that is producing on every IPRA every 90 days. So if there's 100 videos on a request, that we're gonna be working on that for an extremely long time. Um, the cost, I mean, New Mexico has a uniquely expensive public records law. Um, and uh, we, it is something we are working on it. As I told the council last meeting, there are essentially four components to our backlog reduction plan. Um, the first really is legislative change. Until the law is changed, we are going to continue to face expensive IPRA claims. Uh, and this is not unique to us. I mean, all entities across the state are facing significant amounts of IPRA litigation. Uh, it is a matter of concern at the Association of Counties, at the Municipal League, at state risk. Um, we are not alone, we are not unique. Um, so legislative change, staffing. Um, the council has provided a significant amount of funding in the mid-year cleanup for my office. We have in the last six weeks interviewed and hired more people than I can count is what it feels like. But they've all started, they are now working. I will say, I mean, for those of you, uh, since there are a number of you on the dais who are of law enforcement, um, law enforcement records are complicated and that is the most complicated record we process. And so it takes a long time for to train people to process those requests. Um, we are working very hard to get the new people we have hired trained. Um, it is going to take a little bit before I think we start seeing reductions in the numbers. Um, so legislative change, staffing, um, process. I mean, I am always focused on every aspect of our process to make sure we are processing records in the most efficient way possible. I think the struggle at the end of the day uh, is that we, we run into this wall of redaction. Uh, redacting records simply takes a lot of time. If you have an eight hour lapel video, uh, it's going to take someone eight hours to watch that video. And that, um, at least, redacting lapel video can sometimes take as much as three times as long as the length of the video. And if there are multiple officers on scene uh, for eight hours, that there can be as much as um, hundreds and hundreds of hours of video. So we do want to make sure we have a good process. Uh, we do spend a lot of time re-examining every aspect of our process, um, but there are limitations um, given the state of the law to how much um, you know, juice we can squeeze out of that. Um, and so you know, we are working on all elements of this, but um, it is a really complex problem. I think it's easy. you know. Less than 1% of our IPRAs last year resulted in claims. We had over 12,000 requests. We had probably 15 or 16 lawsuits. So um, I will also say, like, litigation is part of public records requests. I mean, that is how the, the laws work. People have a right to request records from government entities. The government entities have specified things that they can redact and withhold. And people have a right to challenge those withholdings um, and seek court review of that. That is simply the way it works, and people do it all the time. And so um, the struggle is that we have, because of our volume, which has been increasing at a rate of 10 to 30% a year, um, we have a large number of claims that are open for a while, or a large number of IPRA cases. So um, you know, our IPRAs take longer to process. 
I will also say that your city is unique in terms of the amount of material that we have to process. So um, when I talk to other entities, you know, it, there's a couple things in IPRA land that make a big difference. Uh, one of them is, do you have a jail? If you have a jail, um, you're going to end up with a lot of um, jail and corrections related records, which are time consuming to process. We are fortunate we don't have a jail, but we do have a 911 center. Uh, there are some municipalities that do not have a 911 center, and as a result, they don't have to process requests for 911 calls and dispatch errors. Uh, because we do have that, those are records that we have to process, and that just takes more time and adds to the number of rec records that we have to process. Okay, so Mr. President, so what I'm hearing is, is, there, is that there's no written process in place um, that's broken down. So do you have an actual process that states this came and this is this is what level or value um, this um, entry came in at, and how do we handle that? Um, is there a time limit on each section of those processes? How do you break that process down? What are your exact processes to deal with it? Because um, and and how much time are you giving it? Because what I'm looking at is if you have an individual, when I was working in the police department, you had a certain amount of time that you had to get a certain amount of uh, you had to get it out. So if you didn't get it out, then you were responding back. So what kind of process do you have to actually make sure that you're responding to the public, to the request, and getting things out in a timely manner? So uh, we do have extensive written policies. Um, we have um, a lot of policies. We, I will say, um, it is very difficult for us to project when we will complete requests. Uh, we do not, and the law does not require us um, to provide an estimated completion date um, after a request has been declared excessively burdensome and broad. Uh, and I apologize, uh, Council President, Councilor Ventress. Um, so we, um, you know, we work really hard to provide records in a timely fashion, but. Um, it is very, it's just very difficult to project how long it's going to take. We encounter things we don't, um, you know, I think as with the law enforcement officer arriving on scene and you don't know what's going to happen when you get there, we don't know what we are going to encounter when we start, start watching lapel video. Um, it could be that at hour six, all of a sudden, a sex crime victim shows up and then we have to spend the next like two and a half hours tracking that person all over the video. Um, that just takes a lot of time, and it can sort of upend any plan we had for getting that material out. So, one of, Mr. President, so the, the issue that I'm looking at is, is are any of these IPRA requests sitting on somebody's desk not being worked? And if they are, what process do you have to take care of that, and how are you handling um, making sure that these things get done and the accountability of the individuals that you send these IPRA requests to? So I think, um, uh, Council President, Council Sanchez, a couple clarifications. Um, there are just realistic limitations on how much lapel and police records one person can process in a given day. I mean, so for traffic requests, people can really crank out a lot of traffic accident reports. If that's all they're working on, great, we can really hammer those out. Um, but there, you know, with lapel video for more complicated incidents where SWAT is on scene and things like that, um, they may only get one video out. So, um, as I said earlier, every member of our team has between 100 and 120 IPRAs they are working on. Um, this number is going to go down. I mean, as I said earlier, the council has provided significant funding to, for us to hire new staff. As we get more staff, we'll be able to distribute our caseload more broadly, which will increase, I hope, our production rate. Um, but so when someone is working on 120 different IPRAs, um, you know, they come to work each day and realistically they are going to, in any given week, um, produce on probably five to ten requests. And so they're only producing on 40 requests a month. That said, we do ask that, I, I do require that my staff contact all requesters every 30 days. And we work extremely hard to do that um, because the real, like, we aren't going to be providing someone a production every 30 days. It's simply not possible with the amount of staff we have at present. So uh, when we can't contact, when we can't give them something, we alert them that we have a high volume of requests, we're still working on their request, and we'll be in contact when we have 
more information for them. It just doesn't seem like you're doing enough to, um, to actually stop the delays to these people who have the statutory right to get them. It seems like there's more delays than we, than we absolutely can, can be dealing with here. Um, I just want to know how are you going to be dealing with these delays in the future, and you said every 30 days. Is there any way that you can actually up that to even more of a quicker response than 30 days? Because if, in my opinion, we're getting IPRA requests, and what you're telling me is that there's always an excuse why it's delayed. And that's what I'm hearing with this. So what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, is a good, solid process that's going to be able to help you and help the citizens of Albuquerque. And not only that, here's the big thing about IPRA, is if you delay or you don't provide these or you provide excuses for them, then it presents an image of mistrust. And the more, the more you project that image, the more IPRA requests you're going to get. So if you end up changing that cycle, then I think that you'll be able to probably lower the amount of IPRAs that you get in. Um, Council President, Council Sanchez, I, I do appreciate that idea, and it is something that I have actually debated myself, is should we, for example, be contacting requesters every 15 days? I think the struggle is that um, we're not going to be producing, we're still not going to be producing every 15 days, and these messages, when you're working on 100 to 150 requests, do take time, and take time away from processing. And so in my mind, it's better that we, 30 days seems to be a good balance in that it's um, a manageable number, it's regular enough, and it allows us to focus on actually getting requests out the door, um, which is really my overall focus is just ultimately closing things. But right now, I mean, in given the balance of staffing and um, partial production, we, we focus on 30 days, and so we, are, we endeavor to um, communicate with everyone every 30 days when we can. But we'll say we also do try to respond to requesters if they message us. So if like, you know, if a requester messages us and says, you know, I know you guys are swamped, but if you could just get me the dispatch errors or just get me the one calls, we will try to honor that if we can. Like, so we do try to be very responsive to people's needs, but we also try to realistically inform the public of our, uh, of the significant volume of requests the city has. And again, uh, we are not unique in this respect. I mean, public entities across the country are being flooded with public records requests right now. It's, an ex it's a nationwide explosion of public records requests. Let's go to Councilor Pena. We'll wrap this up. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to just reiterate, what, I know we talked about that, this at the last council meeting, and you answered a lot of these questions, and I appreciate Councilor Sanchez's uh, concerns and questions, but, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned last time at the New Mexico Municipal League just exactly what you're talking about now is this is just exploding. Uh, I think, you know, people are suing based on not getting all the information, not enough information, not in a timely manner. So it's really creating a problem. I think I mentioned last time, too, that, you know, we really have to look at how we look at that process in, in terms of identifying. I know I just got an IPRA from Larry Barker, and I just have to commend the staff because they put together like a four-inch binder of information. So I can't even imagine the time that it takes on one IPRA that um, to have, you know, masses of amounts of IPRA. So um, just appreciate it. And, and I know I think that's one of the requests you have um, within the budget or one of the... Um, the cause, you know, the issue papers. So um, yeah. just thank you. No, we do, uh, Council President, Councilor Pena, we do appreciate that. And uh, I, I will say the council's been lucky. I mean, uh, the council's re request volume has been about 40 a year forever. For some reason, it's like 40 to 100, and it's been very stable, which is great. Uh, so in contrast, the city's volume has been, um, the, the rest of the city's volume has been increasing at a rate of 10 to 30 percent a year. Um, a huge amount of it does relate to traffic accidents. I don't really understand why. Um, there's a large number of firms that really just like, want to know what's going on in traffic accidents. And, and then land use is the other huge area, right? Huge demand for land use records. The great thing about land use records is there's basically no redaction at all, so we do get, the, we do get land use records out extremely quickly. I mean, we always respond on land use within 15 days. I mean, yeah. All right, thank you. We're going to move on to the journal. Okay. Thank you. I could talk about this forever. Sorry. Um, Mr. President, I move approval of the March 4th journal. Motion is second. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. We're going to go to communications and introductions. Any changes to the letter of introduction? Councilor Baca. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 86 on the April 3rd Council agenda instead of referring it to the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee. EC 86 is the Mayor's appointment of Mr. Adrian Carver to the Environmental Planning Commission. Uh, second. Motion is second for suspension of the rules. This is EC 86. Any discussion, questions? Those in favor say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Council Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 87 on tonight's agenda for action. EC 87 is the mayor's recommendation of award of RFP 2024-522-DFA-EV Migrant Assistance Services. A motion is seconded by Councillor Bassan. Uh, this is a rule suspension for EC 87. Any discussion, questions? Those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 90 on tonight's agenda for, for action. EC 90 is the Uptown Transit Center Joint Development Partnership Agreement, uh, increased reimbursement, third supplemental. Um, need a second. Second. Uh, second by Councilor Grout. Vice President Grout uh, needs a two-thirds vote. There's a um, suspension for EC 90. Uh, those in favor say yes. Raise yes. your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, move the rules to be suspended to, for the purpose of placing EC 91 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC 91 is the mayor, mayor's recommendation of award for RFP 2023-458, well, self-funded medical insurance administrator services. Uh, uh, motion is seconded by Councilor Bassan. Um, any questions, discussion? Uh, needs a two-thirds vote. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, we'll go to Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. I make a motion to amend the letter of introduction for the purpose of placing R29 on the April 3rd Council agenda instead of referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. R29 is um, the appropriation of op opioid settlement funds. A motion is second by Councilor Bassan. Any questions? Discussion? Uh, again, this is R29 uh, going to the letter of introduction. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Vice President Grau. Mr. President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. Second. A motion is second by uh, Council Rogers uh, for approval. Uh, those in favor say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. Uh, motion passes. We're going to go to reports of committees. Council Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, March 11th, and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC-41, ec Dash 43 and EC 72 that they be approved. In the matter of EC 46 and EC 61 that receipt be noted. In the matter of OC 7 that it be without recommendation. In the matter of O 4, R 17, R 21 that they do pass. In the matter of R 15 that it do pass and be acted upon at the meeting in which it was reported. I make a motion to accept the committee. Uh, reports. Motion and a second by Councillor Feeblecorn to accept the uh, uh, Finance and Government Operations Committee report. Those in favor say yes. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, March 13th and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC55, that it be confirmed. In the matter of R16 and R18, that they do pass. In the matter of O3 and R22, that they do pass as amended, and in the matter of O6, that it do pass as substituted, I make a motion to accept the committee reports. I motion a second by, by Vice President Grau. Uh, questions, discussion? I would, I would assume no. Uh, so uh, those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, we go to deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals and withdrawals this time? Uh, Councilor Champagne. Yes, I make a motion to pull uh, EC 68 from tonight's consent agenda. Uh, that's on the consent agenda. So oh, okay. Let's go to the consent agenda. Um, no, no deferrals, withdrawals. Um, so uh, we'll go to consent agenda. Any changes to the consent agenda, Councilor Sampon? Yes. I make a motion to pull uh, EC 68 from the Okay, agenda, 68's please. off the consent agenda. Anybody else? So I need a motion to... Um, Motion to approve, go ahead and make the motion, Councilor Grout, sorry. Mr. President, I move approval of the consent agenda. 
Uh, so that's been moved and seconded. This is the consent agenda uh, with item 68 um, pulled off of it. Um, any discussion, question, any others? Uh, Councilor Rogers? Sure, just, just thank you, Mr. President. Just a question of, of why, would, why we were pulling that one. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay? So um, we'll, let's get to it. We just we just pulled it, so let's get back okay. on the, we'll, let, we'll go ahead and uh, move on the consent agenda first, and we'll get back to you. So, um, so the, the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes. Yes, yes those opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, so now we go to item 68, um, Councilor Champagne. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, uh, EC 2468 is Mayor's appointment of Ms. Charlotte Parsons to the Albuquerque Housing Authority Board. Um, I received several phone calls on this from constituents wanting me to, uh, uh, basically giving me a lot of questions, and I wanted this a little more time into uh, reviewing the uh, appointment. So I, I would like to make a motion to uh, vote to defer it. Two weeks, please. Second. The motion is to defer for two weeks, seconded by Councilor Basson. Any questions or discussion? Councilor Rogers? Thank you, Mr. President. I think he just answered in his okay. explanation why. Thank you. Right, any other uh, discussion questions? The motion is for a deferral. Uh, this is EC 2468. Uh, two, two, uh, any other discussion or question? Uh, those in, did I say that right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> those in favor say yes. Yes. Raise your hand, yes. Those opposed, no. Uh, motion passes. Uh, we go to announcements. There are none. No financial instruments, no appeals, and no. we'll go to general public comments. Members of the public can provide live public comments to the council in person or virtually. If they have signed up for a public comment, per the instructions published on the agenda and on our website Friday. Here are the, the public comment ground rules. Each participant has two minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the councilors only through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the meeting. Uh, there's a two-minute time limit. Bell will ring to indicate your time is up. Mr. Cornelius, you'll please name the first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker this evening is Ellis Hill, followed by Teresa Garcia. I say to Council, thank you all for having me. Uh, I'm not from here. I'm from a southern a country town in Moultrie, Georgia. I've been here now four years, and uh, I never saw poverty. I was raised in the country on a farm, and being here has uh, really taken a toll on my heart, and I always felt called to help the people, and especially the kids, because no one dreams anymore. It's uh, really, really sad that you grow up in a home and no one dreams. I'm a dreamer. I was raised by my father and mother, seven boys. And, you know, coming to this city has really opened my eyes and uh, I always felt called to do something great. So I'm starting a foundation here, a nonprofit organization. It's called AJNL. And uh, we will be joining the fight here. And what we're going to do is the impossible because the possible is not working. Thank you, City Council. Hopefully, you all can join the fight too, sir. Teresa Garcia, followed by Steve Morrison. Good afternoon. As you are aware, we have a lot to celebrate, and it goes to show the dedication we have from those on the commission prioritizing collaboration and communication. However, I come before you today with a humble request for your support regarding a significant change that the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Commission has recently undergone. It has come to our attention that the administration has made a decision to move the commission under the purview of the Albuquerque Police Department with a designated liaison under Commander Hartsock, where it has indicated, where the administration has indicated um, organizationally nothing would change. This decision, while perhaps good with good intentions, raises concerns for our commission. Domestic violence is not merely a law enforcement issue. It is a complex public health crisis that requires multifaceted approach for effective inter intervention and prevention. 
Placing the DVSA commission under the umbrella of a police department may inadvertently send the wrong message and limit our ability to address the root cause of domestic violence. Furthermore, the, ma the manner in which this decision was made is disheartening. The commission was not included in the conversations that led to this decision. Despite our role in advising the mayor and addressing the concerns on behalf of survivors within our community, the lack of inclusion negates the collaborative efforts we have diligently put forth with APD in the past, and it undermines the transparency and the trust that are vital for our commission to function appropriately. As the chair of the DVSA commission, and most importantly, a survivor and a constituent, I feel it's my duty to advocate for the best interest of our commission and survivors we serve. I believe that in order for us to continue important work, it is crucial for the commission to be placed back under the mayor's office where it originally resided. Additionally, we must ensure that our city liaison is a domestic violence and gender-based violence expert maintaining the same standard of expertise in our previous liaison possessed. Alternatively, it is deemed more appropriate we seek that your support in finding a more suitable entity under which the commission can operate independently and effectively. Our goal remains unwaveringly to provide comprehensive support and advocacy for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault within our community. I implore you, esteemed city council members, to consider our request and support ensuring the, DVA, the DVSA commission can continue its vital work for the autonomy and resources necessary to make a real difference in the lives of survivors. Thank you for your time. Steve Morrison, followed by Colby Chavez. Good evening. My name is Steve Morrison. I'm addressing EC 2487 to fund the migrant shelter. Uh, I have volunteered for several years uh, helping asylum seekers, first with Catholic Charities and more recently with Albuquerque Asylum Seeker Welcome. What might, what might make my viewpoint unique is I am a registered Republican, a social conservative, as well as a devout Christian. So my comments today are to you council members who share my political conservative views. Uh, issues such as this usually turn into a broader debate about our immigration system and what should be done at our southern border. My point is the following. We can be a proponent of a secure border. We can be disgusted at the situation caused by the current administration. We can believe that the current asylum system is broken and abused by thousands. And we can also have compassion for those who are coming into our country destitute and broken. These beliefs are not a contradiction. I have worked with hundreds of asylum seekers. They have legal status in our country. They are not to, bl be, they are not to blame for a broken system, nor should they be the ones punished. As I listen to their stories and understand the violence and poverty they flee, I would do the exact same thing if I were in their situation. I do not believe this is a political issue, this is simply a humanitarian issue. I hope we can be decent human beings and follow the second great commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. Thank you. Colby Chavez, followed by Rudolph Serrano. Rudolph Serrano, followed by Antoinette Suina. Uh, President Council, uh, Donna Luis, uh, members of the Council. Um, to be a proud father starts by being a proud son. And um, our Father God teaches uh, in the Genesis 3, 1, um, that he said, let it be light. And light was created in darkness. He created dark and lightness. And um, my research is, is in that, uh, is, is to include the blind and the deaf. But it, it tells us that before anything is, you have a sound. So we're using a phonons instead of photons, which is zero of our scientific research. So we're starting not only a new movement, but a new movement in research to help us uh, uh, see and hear things better. And one day, hopefully, we can say, like Jesus says to the blind, you can see, and to the deaf, you can hear by using uh, this new uh, 
research. But um, I'm here to speak a little bit more of uh, what is going on in the world of neurobiology and politics uh, and geopolitics. And we're trying to apply, you know, this, uh, putting everything into the scope. And I'm starting with the homeless because that's, uh, that's my project too, the PTSD. are the only ones that, that you're gonna get back. That means that two thirds, you lost your money. We put 46 million, we only gonna get 15 million back. So where do we put those 30 million that are gonna kind of help us more? Because this depression is, is national. And uh, we have uh, six things. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working in rumination, which is just walking around like our homeless do. And uh, that's what my project does. But uh, this is my time. <laughs> Have a Antoinette Suina, followed by Ariana Suina. Can you see it there? Yeah. Thank you for having us here again. Um, I'm going to start before my time runs out. Chief Medina's emphasis on accountability, integrity, and transparency upon assuming his position several years ago sounded good. However, there have been instances where he has failed to take in accountability for his actions and has skirted around issues diminishing transparency. This raises concerns about our confidence in current leadership. Such actions do not foster public trust, which is essential for effective governance in, and community engagement. I would like to speak on three major points. This question is for Councillor Bosan. I um, live in your district. Chief Medina's, um, I'm sorry, um, this, uh, sorry. Having an outside, um, in, outside entity investigate the uh, Chief Medina's accident um, appropriate and supports the hardworking rank and file of police officers. This is imperative because Lieutenant James Ortiz is doing the investigation and having a lower ranking officer conducting the investigation of this magnitude is unacceptable. Why would you vote against having an outside investigation? Number two, I have zero faith in Eric Garcia, Garcia overseeing the investigation of Medina as he was the one who failed to take disciplinary actions on the officer that caused my son's death. The system failed us. We didn't see change for our family from that administration until Chief Geyer took office. My file sat on Eric Garcia, Garcia's desk past the 90 days. It wasn't until an outside investigation um, took place by BCSO, my case started to move forward. Number three, what if it was your six-year-old son? that you are planning a funeral for? What if it was your nine-year-old daughter laying in a coma in critical condition? What would you have done in my position? Thank you, ma'am. Ariana Suina, followed by Justin Allen. Just a moment. Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. The question I had brought me, it brought something up. I just wanted, I asked a question last year and I'm looking for Somebody that can answer it, but I guess I'll ask the administration because none of the police officers are here. Um, I asked a, a question about the uh, these these folks actually uh, provided as part of their settlement a um, simulator, a driving simulator, and uh, turns out we did a little bit of research in reference to the driving simulator. It was told that it was at the academy, and it's not at the academy. It's at the reality reality based training center. And then I asked actually to see who the, what the training logs were and any sign-in sheets in reference to, uh, to that simulator. And, uh, and also to see if uh, Chief Medina had actually um, used the simula simulator uh, prior to his accident that caused great bodily harm or great bodily injury. And uh, I still do not have that um, response. Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, I will follow up personally on all of those and make, make sure that we follow through on those for you. Thank you. 
Hello, and thank you for having me here this evening. I'm here to discuss the topic of change needing to take place and the importance of having good leadership. My question is how many more innocent lives need to be taken and how many more critical conditions need to be seen due to the recklessness and carelessness of those who have the role to serve and protect. While accidents do happen, accountability must be upheld, which is something that some of our officers who've been at fault lack, including the chief of APD. I'm here to shed light on the fact that many of these types of accidents are re reoccurring and should stop. When something isn't working, change needs to take place. When officers make the decisions to take their role, they are held at a higher standard because they are taking the role as one of our leaders. But who is leading them? When they don't have a person in command who is leading by a good example, that's when protocols get broken and these types of incidents happen. From our accident, we wanted to help things like this from to stop happening by donating a driving simulator, which is supposed to help officers train and prevent these types of tragic incidents. What's the point of having all these trainings and precautions if they aren't being utilized or taken seriously? I also wanted to make the correction. Um, last time we were here, an officer who was asked the loca location of the driving simulator, um, where he answered it was at the academy. This statement was, in fact, incorrect. It is located um, at the reality-based reality um, training center. Uh, it has been reported to my mom and I that Chief Medina has not yet used our simulator, uh, the driving simulator that we donated. This is one of the reasons why we need a change in leadership. Um, it is unacceptable that the chief of APD has access to these trainings that he hasn't been utilizing. Thank you. Justin Allen, followed by Anami Das. I do want to mention that um, part of our just rules of decorum in the in the in the council is that during uh, public comment we don't allow uh, clapping in the uh, in the chambers, and so I just want to remind you of that. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, City Council. My name is Justin Allen. I'm a resident of the Inter International District. I'm here to, tonight to implore the council to implement some sort of transparency, accountability, and oversight of Albuquerque De Police Department and solid waste. Since the injunction went, went into place on November 1st, 2023, I have been witnessing uh, our unhoused relatives being terrorized by solid waste and Albuquerque Police Department. I have video footage of hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of our tax money being wasted uh, as solid waste workers are standing around joking, eating pizza, and dehumanizing our, our, our unhoused population. Uh, last month, I went out filming what was happening in my neighborhood, and uh, one of the solid waste workers took my license plate, consulted with police, and then proceeded to dox me by giving out my personal address to the unhoused people. Um, Police resources should not be, be, be used to intimidate or dox us. And I ask that uh, this, this city council look into this issue. I did file a complaint with 311. Uh, several days later, I got a call back from a woman who refused to identify herself and claimed to be with the city. Uh, she called from a private number and uh, basically talked over me and did not address my complaint about being doxed. Told me that I didn't know the law and hung up on me. So I filed another complaint and proceeded with a police report. So I implore this uh, council to please look into this issue. Uh, we should not be uh, intimidated by police, or police should not be using their resource to intimidate and, and dox us. Thank you. Thanks, Council Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President, thank this, you. This gentleman right here, J.D. Tapia, is the one who was giving out my personal information, the guy that's on that poster board there. Thank you. I just want to ask the administration to please look into Mr. Allen's case and um, find out why our solid waste is giving out his personal information. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Wheeler. Next speaker. Anabi Das, followed by Marla Painter. Thank you. Um, so this is actually kind of convenient. I have something along the same lines. I was followed home by a city planning vehicle once after filming a similar, uh, uh, what is it, encampment clearing. Um, I didn't file a complaint. I should have. I will. Or it might be too late. Anywho, um, 
I put in an IPRA to see how much money the city has spent on clearing people who are experiencing homelessness since the injunction has gone through. And in the first four months, the city has spent nearly a quarter million dollars on that. Uh, I think that it might be better to house people with that money, to put in public like trash cans or something, public bathrooms, uh, warming station, cooling station, anything is better than like throwing away every or everything that someone owns. Thank you. Marla Painter, followed by James Freeman. Mr. President, members of the council, I actually uh, wish to comment on 2412. When I signed up, I didn't have the number. Would you like me to comment on 2412 now or, or not? Okay. You're welcome to use the time as you like. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Councilor Pena was kind enough to meet with the two neighborhood association presidents in Mountain View, um, and we had a good discussion. Um, However, we took that discussion back to um, neighborhood members, and uh, we're really confused about this resolution. We're hoping that it is not just um, public relations to show that the city council really does care about people in Mountain View, and that it has some concrete uh, intentions that you can, um, that you can explain. Uh, it's very vague, and um, as much as we'll take any of the money that the city would like to give the county to help us with our problems down there, it would be helpful uh, for the city to listen to us before allocating any of the money uh, to any particular project, because I don't think that the city uh, knows much at all about Mountain View. So while we appreciate this, and however you choose to vote for it, just please keep in mind that we want to see something real and not just public relations to show that after, um, excuse me, screwing us um, previously in the uh, council, in the uh, hearings on the HEEI, that you really do intend to do some good in our area, in our neighborhood. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. James Freeman, followed by Tad Newminski. Good evening, y'all. I am James Freeman from District 4. At the last meeting, the most important discussion was held into the absolute very end, and no one saw it live. The live feed died right before the bill was discussed about the multi-agency investigation into the police chief. I texted my buddies who were here asking for updates, but they had to leave the council meeting early also. Thank you to the District 4 analyst, Don Marie, for helping me access the archive feed the following day, because that was the only way anyone could see how the vote went. With respect, I would also urge Councilor Basson to reconsider her vote regarding the multi-agency task force. I do not have confidence that the, the city can adequately investigate the police chief because of the close ties between the mayor and the police chief. We've seen text messages between them. We know how close they are. And so I think an outside multi-agency investigation is the most appropriate. Nice suit, Champon. Thank you. Tad Newminski, followed by Nicholas Kirsch. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, my name is Tad Newminski. Well, just out of the last week, all the day, I, I happened to work cleaning on my pickup. I uh, noticed I purchased from city council for one, uh, one dollar to cite a page, a inspector general report. Well, interesting all the way up to what we, the uh, quarterly re report. Uh, highest, as I seen it, 140 plus. Uh, what, and many, many others. And what is 
solution. Just pay back. Slap, slap on the hand. That, that we don't have any accountability in the, this city government. Corruption is everywhere, including planning and the planning department. When come, money comes from city and then pay back. Now, problem is not only in the city hall. Metro court judges at years back, Oh, my time is running off. Well, I called one judge two years ago. Nicholas Kirsch, followed by Eric Perkins. Uh, hello, my name is Nicholas Kirsch. This is my first time at a city council meeting. I'm here today because I would like to bring it into the public discourse that we have a severe lack of public restrooms. Although this is a great place to live, the access to basic human need is absent and degrades the overall quality of life for the city and community. This is a health crisis as well as a human dignity crisis. It's also a topic that we as residents cannot avoid. I would like to request funding for the for mobile bathrooms and shower units, please. Um, I could I could use the rest of this time to go into horror stories about that, but it's I think unnecessarily crass. Um, I'm I'm a UNM student, like I I'm in that part of town a lot, as as well as I go downtown. And I'm sure all of you have as well. Uh, many times passed by there. Um, there's, there's no public restrooms, and, and there's definitely human waste as, as you're passing, it'll happen. Um, I, I think that's, that's a reasonable starting point, it's a reasonable request um, that, that we as, as a community and as a society should, should work on. Thank you. Eric Perkins. My name is Eric Perkins. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I've lived here in Albuquerque since uh, June 24th, 2015. Um, I just want to make everyone aware that nowhere in the South can a business refuse to allow someone to use the restroom. Uh, I went to Walgreens last night, and, um, and I had my, my items to pay for, but I had to use the restroom. I actually used the restroom, and the gentleman says, we have no public restrooms. And I said, well, I'm not the public. I'm a paying customer. He referred me to his manager who lied to me and said that the restroom was out of order. The guy just told me that it wasn't. And he did, I just couldn't use it. So I left them with Walmart. Um, but I'll tell you this. If you go anywhere in Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, because of what happened during the, the civil, uh, civil rights era, uh, if you have a business, you have to allow people to use the restroom. Like Jim just said, um, it's inhumane. I beg this council to find you a moral compass and not allow businesses to discriminate against people because there's a war on the unhoused and unhoused are losing it. It's a bloodbath. Because people are now blaming people who don't have homes for being homeless. And that is, that is un unjust. But the other thing is, they get to determine on a case-by-case -case basis who they will allow to use the restroom in Walgreens, in Smiths. Um, what happens to these people if they are diabetic and they, they can't hold it? They, they get embarrassed by, by this condition. Um, something needs to be done. Uh, people need to reach deep inside and stop blaming people for their condition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, that concludes general public comment. Oh, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Is Director Varela here?
I thought I seen him earlier. No? Okay, well, to the administration then. So I had talked to Director Varela. Um, at first, I was kind of concerned because I thought that, you know, um, when we went through COVID, um, the public restrooms were closed. And then since then, um, lots of restaurants, uh, people who have kidney disease, which I do, and, and diabetes, like this gentleman said, and not to mention the, the homeless, a lot of the public restrooms are now locked, and you can't, they don't let you access them. And I had asked Director Varela to look into that, and I don't remember if I had received a response or not. So if we can do that, because I don't know if we have, or maybe um, our, our city attorney knows the policy on you know, public facilities. So if we can get that answer for the next meeting, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to approvals. Item 13, item A is EC35, emergency purchase of migrant sheltering service to avoid an interruption in service while FEMA grant funds are being competitively, competitively procured. Um, Councilors, any questions? Uh, um, I. Uh, uh, we'll see what any kind of motion anybody wants to make on this. I, I just have a few questions for our staff. I think Mr. Moscow's here, so um, maybe start with our staff on on uh, on this. Um, well, Mr. Moscow, do you, Mr. you have the original? I'm sorry. Did There's you make not a, been a motion yet? So. Um, Mr. Moscow, um, who had the original contract? Mr. President, point of order. I believe that we have to make a motion in order to discuss it. I'll make a motion for approval. Motion is second for approval. Discussion, Mr. Moscow. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor President Lewis. Um, this is the emergency purchase of uh, migrant sheltering services to avoid an interruption in service while the FEMA grant funds are being comp competitively procured. That is um, EC, I believe, uh, 87. Uh, originally, this contract with United Voices uh, was signed and approved by Michelle Melendrez, Director of OEI, back in April of 20. 23. Payment of the contract was processed through the Department of Finance and Administrative Services out of Fund 265. Uh, for the Council's information, Fund 265 is the fund that handles state and federal grants where they're tracked, processed, paid out, and then reimbursed back into. Um, however, during our research, we noticed on the requisition that it did say that no federal funds were to be used for the contract just that federal standards in, uh, were going to be followed in the anticipation of a possible federal reimbursement. Uh, City Council uh, doesn't dictate, obviously, how departments sign their, uh, set up their fiscal operations, but we do have questions why this wasn't part of OEI's operating budget and then reimbursed back if the FEMA money did come available. And, and how much was the original contract for? The original contract was for $100,000 under what's called a professional technical contract. And then uh, this EC35, uh, the administration came back to us with a $50,000 supplement to that original $100,000. And do we know how much the, the contractor was, has been paid so far? Is it United, United Voices? Sure. So, Council President Lewis, uh, Councilors, my uh, staff have determined through PeopleSoft, our, our software, uh, that about $131,900 has been reimbursed to the contractor. So uh, as, far as, as far as we see, um, $132,000 paid to the contractor so far? Okay. Mr. President, yes. And, and, and where exactly was the contractor paid from? Again? So in uh, the PeopleSoft uh, software, we, we saw that there is an activity number, kind of like a checking account number uh, that the department paid from under Fund 265. This activity uh, was a sub-account to the Fund 265 FEMA grants. However, that activity was more of a catch-all to segregate the United Voices, uh, United Voices invoices from the FEMA grant. Uh, and then it's our understanding that their funds will be taken out of uh, OEI's operating budget. But I would ask you to ask the administration for clarification on that. OK, thank you. So Mr. Sursa, um, so the, the requisition stated that federal funds or only federal funds or were not going to be used, uh, but only anticipated uh, to be used for possible FEMA reimbursement. Uh, so why was the account or the sub-account set up uh, in Fund 265? Council President, Councilors, <clears throat> in an effort to capture all of the costs that we might expend for services that we were 
using for migrants and helping them um, find their way from Albuquerque to their um, future locations for support where they had support. Uh, we collected expenses in Fund 265. So Fund 265, much like uh, Mr. Mosco has said, we use it for federal grants and state grants, but it can, it's also a holding point for any other reimbursed, ex, any other expenses that may be reimbursed. So in an effort to just uh, be able to capture those expenses, not lose track of those expenses, we collected them in uh, Fund 265 and we are now, there's not a reimbursement for um, those services, so we will now journal entry those out with a simple accounting um, journal entries. Uh, we'll move those out into uh, the OEI budget now. So I see that that, that account mm -hmm. is specifically for, um, it's specifically for, you know, charges or, or monies that we know will be reimbursed, right? I mean, so in this specific mm -hmm. situation, it seems like there was some statements that said that we know this will not be reimbursed, that this will not be funded by FEMA, and yet we use that account. Council President, when we, when we set up that activity in that reimbursable fund, uh, we were uncertain whether we would be able to get reimbursement um, for those costs. Reimbursements don't always come from the federal government. There may be reimbursements from state government. There may be re reimbursements from nonprofits. So we parked those expenses there, hoping that there might be some opportunity for reimbursement to pay back taxpayer dollars that we were using for that uh, purpose. Um, but at this point, uh, we are going to move those expenses into the, the fiscal year is coming to an end. We want to move those expenses into the OEI budget where there is, you know, appropriate uh, appropriated funds uh, for contractual services. We're just going to move those expenses there now because we do not believe that there is a chance for those expenses to be re reimbursed at this point by any entity, be it federal, state, or any of our nonprofit entities. So did, did the city request reimbursement from FEMA? Uh, Councilor President Lewis, uh, Council President Lewis, because UNVR was procured very quickly without following the stringent and um, federal procurement rules, we could not seek reimbursement from the federal government for UNVR's expenses. You didn't try? I mean, we didn't, we didn't anticipate uh, any kind of, and, and actually make any kind of request for reimbursement? Cou Council President, um, the federal government is not going to reimburse us unless we have a contract that has been procured following their federal, their stringent federal procurement rules. You said we had hopes, though. We had hopes that we'd be reimbursed. Why do we hope? be reimbursed, but then not follow through and even request it. Council President, we were looking for reimbursement from any, ent any entity that we could. When we first set this up, we were just simply trying to help migrant uh, folks that were being dropped off here um, from ICE. Uh, you know, we've heard a gentleman speak already about the, the nature of, of these, uh, the, the, the plight of these individuals who are being released from ICE. We were just simply collecting these expenses, trying to help these folks move on to their final destinations. And at the time, you know, we hoped there might be some opportunity for reimbursement and better to put these expenses in a fund that can cross fiscal years so that if we get a reimbursement um, outside of a fiscal year, we can go back and um, clear out those expenses with whatever, whatever reimbursement we've, we've received. So, so what's, the, what's the status of United Voices? Are they, are they still providing services to migrant families right now? Council President, uh, Councilors, no, they are not providing services. And uh, we certainly appreciate we have 87 on the agenda today. We certainly appreciate your willingness to make that uh, available for immediate action. Um, and that is one of the reasons that we need it. Um, we need immediate action on that contract is because United Voices is no longer providing services for migrants. So is city staff help. right now providing those services instead of United Voices? Council President, we are, yes, city staff is, is trying to keep up with that. Where's and that budget? Where's that coming from? Where are those expenses budgeted out of? Council President, um, th those expenses will be paid either out of OEI or we can seek reimbursement under the federal uh, the federal grant that you approved, I believe, back in November. That was a seven hundred and something thousand dollar federal grant that you did uh, approve and appropriate. 
So any expenses that the city incurs either for meals, for any other contractors that are federally procured, uh, we can uh, go ahead and charge or bill the federal government. And we have a pretty good uh, reimbursement rate, you know, 90 to 95 percent FEMA reimbursement rate history um, that goes back many, many years. Any, any services being provided right now that are not covered under reimbursement, FEMA reimbursement? We are providing services. We expect that uh, we can get reimbursement. I, you know, we, we've got a good track history with uh, FEMA and our uh, percentage of reimbursement, but I, I couldn't tell you that 100% of those expenses that we might bill will be reimbursed by FEMA. Well, Councilor Vassan and Councilor Rogers. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Sorso, I. Why would we not have put the funding coming from the OEI budget line instead of from the 265? Council President, Councilor Bassan, if we charged it immediately to the Office of Equity and Inclusion and then we got reimbursement, it becomes more complicated. If we put those expenses, we collected them under that activity, they are in a fund that can cross fiscal years, we can easily go back and offset the expense in that fund with any reimbursement that we might have received. Um, and we can do that across fiscal years. If we put those expenses in the OEIs, uh, but if we charge it to the OEIs budget in a particular fiscal year, the fiscal year closes, we get reimbursement a month or two after the fiscal year closes. We can't go back and offset those expenses because the year has closed. Uh, Mr. President, on You've said a couple times that, well, this time you said it would be more complicated if we would have done putting it in OEI's budget. But earlier you said it was just a simple accounting change, which respectfully, there's nothing simple about what you've just rattled off. Um, but at the same time, I just, I hope that our, so Councilors Pena and Feeblecorn and I have a grant ordinance that we're working on. And I'm really hoping it streamlines a lot of this because this whole apply for a grant, ask forgiveness later, juggle funds for emergency whatevers is, is really complicated. And, and it's, I'm not pointing fingers at any person. I mean, I literally just did that, but I didn't mean to. Uh, but, you know, I, I just, we have to get a hold of this because we can't, I mean, you also mentioned that we hope to get reimbursement from somewhere. And that's not how a city runs. We can run on a lot of hope, but we heard from a constituent earlier tonight, there's no hope left. That's how the people of Albuquerque are feeling, and we can't hope to use their budget accordingly. We can't hope that after we've spent all the money, we can find it from somewhere else that's just going to rain from the sky. Like, we can't keep doing that. And we, I hope we start with applying for these grants more and more, and the city gets more federal funding, more what private funding, more any funding, but we can't spend it before we have it. And I, I really do hope that we get that under control. Back to our, our finance staff, I mean, you know, the, the council is, is tasked with, you know, we approve our budget each year. We have um, a lot of guidelines in there. We have grants like this that come before us or expenditures like this that are, you know, decisions that we have, you know, to approve or not because that's our responsibility. So um, is this, in your, your opinion, I guess, is this, is this a, a practice um, as far as, you know, the, these dollars and how they're spent and, I mean, is it, is, it, is it common? Is it something that's out of the ordinary? Is there a better way uh, that, uh, that this should have been handled and should have been done? Um, and, and again, I'm not asking, I guess, your opinion as much as, you know, what's been done, what are, what are the procedures and guidelines and should be done according to our, our, uh, our rules? Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and Counselors. Uh, I think in this situation, uh, because it did happen in, in April of 2023 and I, I wasn't here, um, I think the administration is coming back, you asked for my opinion, with EC87 and doing it properly with the award of the RFP for migrant services, using the FEMA grant money that was uh, granted to the city and appropriated by this body in November. So I don't necessarily think EC35, I mean, emergency purchase already happened, the vendor has been paid, uh, this is just an executive communication, but I think they are doing it the right way with EC87. Uh, On the other bill, so, Councilor Rogers. 
Sure. I just uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just have a question to all. Can we, and during my time in OEI, I overheard a lot of conversations around the partnership between OEI and OEM for this work. So did we also look in OEM's budget to see if there are any things being paid out of OEM, Office of Emergency Management? Council President, Councilor, uh, Councilor Rogers, um, this funding or the, the money that we've paid uh, UNVR that we're going to move, we are moving it to OEM's budget. They've got a little larger budget uh, sorry, OEI. They've got a little larger budget than OEM, so we're moving it to OEI. Okay, so there were, there have not been historically any charges for asylum seeker work out of OEM? Uh, or can we Council double President, check? Council Rogers, I believe that to be a true statement. Um, the Office of Emergency Management works a lot with OEI, and FEMA grants work through OEM, so there is always there has always been collaboration uh, between the two can we double check that we, there are no charges for asylum seeker work in OEM mr. president council Rogers um, I don't think that we're stating that there are no charges in OEM I think the UNVR contract was not charged is not going to be charged from OEM so if you're asking a different question about all charges related to migrant sheltering we can do an accounting and show where that is coming, where that has been charged. Yeah. But that I think those are two different. I just want to make sure we're answering the question asked because this is about one contract with UNVR. Um, it will be charged to OEI. Right, but Mr. President, I think my point is is I think our body is trying to get a handle on what we're spending on this type of work, which is very important. I'm not saying we don't spend it. Please don't get that wrong. We do need to be providing this service. Um, but to get an idea of what we're spending, I know it's not only in OEI's budget. So can we double check what's what's coming out of OEM as well? Mr. President, Council Rogers, absolutely. We can absolutely do an accounting. We did not do an accounting of all expenses for tonight. So we do have some public comment, Mr. Cornelius. Yeah, let's we'll, we'll go to Councilor Pena first, and we'll go to public public comment. Thank you, Mr. President. I think this leads to a question or a comment that we've been kind of making throughout the years. Is I think we've had this conversation several times. I know um, with the FEMA dollars, obviously, um, you know, it's difficult when we're applying for grants and, and we have all the, a multitude of grants throughout the city and how we administer them. And so maybe before the administration sends out down the budget, they should really look at, I, I know that within the, the uh, mayor's office and, and within city council, uh, I think we really, really need to, because we do need to apply for more grants, right? We need more money. I think we have uh, three to one in terms of dollar reimbursements that we can be getting. So I've asked this question in the past, and I think we really need to dive into it this go around is to look into creating a department of grants management so that, you know, we look at, um, following through with the application process and how we administer it and then how we um, make sure that we're um, meeting the guidelines of the grants because it seems like this this happens um, um, more often than than we care and uh, as you all know we received a call from the White House related to to this and and they want to make sure that we're using the money as well so thank you Councilor Rogers. Thank you. I just want to echo uh, Councilor Pena's comments. I just came back from Washington, D.C. Um, and heard of, from several federal agencies how we don't, I think we, they gave me a calculation of $130 per capita per person is all we're bringing in for federal funding, um, which is pretty astonishing to me. They, every session that I went to about federal funding, they talked about how this is a once in a generation landfall of money that's available and every time I send like and I don't know when we've been here for three months in this role but every time I send a grant application to a department to say let's go let's do this I hear it's too hard we can't do it we don't know how to do federal grants and so I echo that a hundred percent I think we're leaving a lot of money on the table that could help with a lot of our initiatives if we had a, a department that's supposed to be that's all they do is go after the federal dollars because we're, we are leaving a ridiculous amount on the table. Thank you. Mr. President and uh, Councilor Pena and Rogers, thank you. Um, as you all know, we recently um, went through the public procurement process to acquire contracts for um, specialized grant writers that have variations of skills so that we don't have to pass on something because we don't have the in-house skill 
gives us an opportunity to pursue um, both federal, state, and often um, private dollars that we maybe have not done in the past based upon both capacity and skill. Um, and I think we did a pretty fantastic job actually of making sure we have a variety of options so that we don't have to, you know, if you hire a grant writer, I have written many, many, many grants in my, in my, his in my, his in my uh, previous roles, but I could not have written every type of grant, if that makes sense. I had areas of specialty. Federal is uh, just within the federal government, those specializations between DOE, DOL, D, all, pick the D, and uh, they all have a different variety. So I appreciate that you are supportive of that, and I think we share the same view of interest. Councilor Bennett. Thank you. Just to follow up, so I think we do need to do um, applying for grants, but grants management is a whole different animal, right? So I think that's what we really need to look at as well. So thank you. Let's go to public comment. Thank you, Mr. President. We have Eleanor Milroy, followed by Jared Weatherholtz. President Lewis and counselors, good evening. I'm Eleanor Milroy of St. Andrew Presbyterian Church and a co-director of Albuquerque Asylum Seeker Welcome. I am here to speak in support of migrant sheltering services. Albuquerque Asylum Seeker Welcome receives buses of asylum seekers sent by either ICE or the Border Patrol to Albuquerque. We are primarily faith-based volunteers from across the city who take the biblical lesson to welcome the stranger seriously. The asylum seekers arrive with literally nothing but the ICE-provided clothes on their back and their precious ICE documents. Everything they brought from home is thrown away at the border, from rosaries to medications to diapers. Our job is to get them clothing, medical attention, food, and help them with their travel plans to their sponsors and get them to the airport or bus station. Their stories are heartbreaking their spirit and determination uplifting. One woman arrived with her 14-year-old twin daughters from Central America. Her son, who ran a used tire shop, was told to pay an extortion fee, which he could not afford, or his twin sisters would be forced into prostitution. Mom began her trip north the next day with her twin daughters. A nine-year-old boy was a witness to his grandmother's murder in Honduras. At our hotel here in Albuquerque, he finally felt safe and was able to come out of himself a bit. Our families have slugged through the horror of the Darien Gap. They have been robbed, raped, beaten, kidnapped, and extorted. They deserve to have a safe place to be at least, for at least a little bit, to restore as they move on to their sponsors. That is what the $400,000 allows, a 24-7 safe shelter that is not possible using only volunteers. I am proud and grateful to this city for what you have done to support migrants. I pray your vote to support this effort. It is needed. Jared Weatherholtz, followed by Mike Angel. Good evening. My name is Jared Weatherholtz. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Catholic Charities, and I'm here to speak on EC87, uh, expressing our um, support as Catholic Charities. Uh, I want to let you know that we um, uh, do trust and uh, commit to the city's plan for this uh, welcome and transitional shelter for asylum seekers who are newly arrived to our city. Catholic Charities is committed to honoring human dignity uh, by putting faith into action to improve the lives of those in need. We've been involved in partnering in the work of serving the most vulnerable in our community for many years. Uh, we'll continue to support the city as they open the shelter and we'll support new arrival people through our programs and services. Um, we believe this is a good plan that's on the table, so please consider approving this funding to move forward so that we can support those newly arriving to our city. Thank you. Mike Angel, followed by Gwen Robinson. Mr. President and members of the council, my name is the Reverend Mike Angel. I am the rector, the head pastor of St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church up on Montano. I think there's a little bit of confusion. Many of us actually are here to uh, comment in favor of uh, the second of these bills rather than 35. Uh, there's confusion over which one. I hope it's okay if I give my comment in favor of 87 right now. 
For the past several years, we've been housing asylum seekers at our landing ministry at St. Michael's, housing those the city could not. In recent months, we have had a collaborative relationship with the city and UVNR, uh, housing those the city couldn't take. We've housed over 100 migrants last year on short notice, uh, over 20 of them the week of Christmas as we were busy preparing. We've done this work because we believe our faith compels us to care for our neighbor, to care for the stranger. We've done this work in an emergency, and we are here asking the city for help. You've already gone through a bidding process. You've been awarded a federal grant uh, that follows all of the guidelines. Uh, it wouldn't be city tax dollars to pay for this. The facility identified by the city is both more spacious and more appropriate than our former church offices where we have been housing folks. So I'm grateful for the hard work of the city employees to take up the work. We're eager to continue sending volunteers uh, to work with asylum seekers. We urge you to work with us. You're likely in this public comment to hear talking points uh, downloaded from our national debate, but what's at stake tonight is whether more migrants will end up at my church and those who don't fit will end up on Albuquerque streets. I ask you, don't use these vulnerable people to score political points. We don't have the capacity to continue the work to house asylum seekers on our own at St. Michael's. We don't have the capacity to care for everyone needing care. We're grateful to the city for putting forward this contract to care for our migrant neighbors. Please vote to approve. Thank you. Gwen Robinson, followed by Steve Morrison. Thank you. I know that many of you are commenting on EC 2487, which is fine, because we'll see that here in just a moment. Uh, but this is EC 35, and you're welcome to speak on e either one, I guess. Um, uh, so just know that that's going to come up next. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, counselors, for allowing me to speak. Like most of you, I am descended from immigrants. All four of my Jewish grandparents immigrated from Russia in the early 1900s. Why? Because of oppression, poverty, and pogroms. After passing through Ellis Island, communities took them in. My paternal grandfather initially raked iron out of a junkyard, saving his wages until he could buy a horse and cart to become a peddler, gathering metal and furs. He saved and started a scrapyard, taking in what nobody wanted. My maternal grandfather also was a peddler, selling groceries door to door. These stories are no different from those of today's immigrants and asylum seekers who must flee their countries for the same reasons, poverty and persecution. Because of what my family experienced, I feel a deep need to welcome and assist those arriving today. I've been a physician for almost 50 years, and since 2019, I have volunteered along with many agencies to help care for asylum seekers. <clears throat> I volunteer with the New Mexico Medical Reserve Corps, whose mission is to augment local community health and medical services during disasters like fires, public health emergencies like COVID, and community public health events, with over 2,000 Department of Health credentialed volunteers. But medical staff cannot do it alone. We absolutely need the support staff to maintain the functioning and safety of the shelter. Please support and fund Albuquerque's newest shelter and its support staff to help us carry on the welcoming tradition of our country with compassion, respect, and decency. Thank you. Steve Morrison, followed by Catherine Elliott. Elliot, pardon me. Catherine Elliott, followed by Frank Rogers. Frank Rogers, followed by Clara Sims on Zoom. Clara, can you please accept promotion to panelist?
Clara, would you like to unmute and, and speak? Uh, Mr. President, there appears to be some technical difficulties, so I'll try to bring her back on for the next one. Okay. If, if she's back on while we're discussing, it'll be. All right. Uh, the, this is, uh, again, EC35 has been moved and seconded. Uh, Councilors, any other discussion or questions? Um, I just want to comment. I mean, in, in, in these bills, I mean, I haven't heard any discussion or conversations up here uh, about any national talking points or, you know, the, uh, you know, some of the um, issues related to immigration, things like that. That's not just what, that's just not what we've been discussing. We've been specifically, you know, discussing the use of funds and the, the accounts and, and the proper way to, uh, to be able to do these kind of uh, grants and, and offer these kinds of services. And so that's what the discussion is. Although, I mean, that discussion could go anywhere it would like, but um, uh, that's really the, that's the discussion that we've had and everything leading up to this bill right now. So, Councilors, any other discussion, questions? All right, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes, those opposed, no. Motion, motion uh, passes on an eight to one. Um, we'll go to EC87, this is mayor's recommendation to award for RFP for 2024-522 DFA EV Migrant Assistance Services. Uh, move approval. Motion second. Anybody sign up to speak? For this? Right. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Steve Morrison signed up again. Um, we will go to Andres Esquivel and then Alondra Reyes on Zoom. Hello, uh, good, good evening, Mr. President and members of the council. Um, Without repeating much of what other folks have already said, I hope you all approve the funding for this migrant shelter. And of course, um, with it being contracted to an out-of-state company, I would like um, a lot of oversight to make sure that nothing goes nothing goes wrong. Um, thank you. Now I move to Alondra Reyes on Zoom. Hi, um, my name is Alondra Reyes. I am an asylum paralegal at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. It is critical that the city of Albuquerque demonstrate solidarity and support for our immigrant communities and that we support EC 2487 to aid asylum seekers through a safe immigration process. Through my work, I often encounter people who are eligible to apply for asylum. However, due to the current immigration process, they are not legally allowed to apply for a work permit until 150 days after applying for asylum. This prolonged period of not being able to access lawful employment leads to housing instability and vulnerability to labor exploitation, a situation that harms all workers. A current client comes to mind. He has applied for asylum and in waiting these 150 days, he has been unemployed leading to his homelessness and suffering of multiple robberies and assaults as a result. New Mexico Immigrant Law Center urges the City Council to pass his request to further humanize and support the immigrant community that makes up a huge portion of our population. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes comments on this item. All right, thank you. This is EC87. It's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Uh, Council, any questions? Discussion. All right. Uh, we'll go to vote. Those in favor, say yes. Raise your hand. Uh, those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, we're going to take our, our our break back here. Um, in a Councilor Lewis, can I confirm, Councilor Pena? I didn't see your hand. Did you vote for or against? It was a nine to zero, unanimous. Um, so we'll take our thirty minute break. We're back here a little bit before eight o'clock.
All right, we're, we're back on uh, item B. This is uh, um, E79, appointment of Kevin Sursaw, at, uh, CPA, to the position of Chief Financial Officer. I move confirmation. A motion is second by Councilor Champagne. Anybody sign up to speak? All right, Councilors, any discussion, questions? All right, administration. Kevin, would you like to make comments? Mr. President, I'd like to introduce Kevin Sursaw. All right. Council President and uh, Councilors, uh, I urge your support and I would really appreciate this opportunity to uh, put the experience and education, uh, everything I've learned over the last 31 years in and around government to work for the city. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council, any questions, discussion? All right, we'll go to a vote. Um, those in favor, say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Yes, those opposed, no. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Sosa. Mr. Forward President. Forward to working with you. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry for the record, Councilor Rogers and Baca excused. Yeah, we'll let them do that if they're on the way. Um, <clears throat> uh, item C is, is uh, EC80, appointment of Patrick Montoya to the position of Chief Operations Officer. I move com confirmation. Second. Motion is seconded by Vice President uh, Grout. Uh, <laughs> Council, any questions, discussion? Um, we sign up to speak. No, Mr. Montoya here tonight? Mr. President, um, Mr. Montoya is here. Um, as you all know, he's had a very long career in um, the city's uh, administration across, I think I counted three different, maybe four different administrations? Four. Um, and very distinguished service to the city. I'm actually very honored that I have the opportunity to have him work alongside our team and um, would love for him to share his, a few words. Uh, Mr. President and Council, uh, first, let me thank the mayor and the CAO for their confidence in me and appointing me to this position. I also want to assure my fellow directors and all city employees that I pledge my support in uh, attaining any of your goals and objectives in the department itself. And then finally, I've worked with all of you over the years, but again, a commitment to work with you directly and your staff in order that you meet your goals and objectives as well. So with that, I stand for any questions, but thank you for allowing me to serve in this role. Thank you, sir. The counselors? All right. Uh, uh, this is EC, um, EC80. Uh, those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. yes. Uh, those opposed? The motion passes. Thank you again, sir. <clears throat> EC90, uh, this is up down tran Uptown Transit Center Joint Development Partnership Agreement uh, to increase reimbursement, third supplemental, move approval. Our motion is seconded by Councilor Bassan. Uh, anyone signed to speak? Um, Councilors, any questions, discussion, administration, comments? Mr. President, uh, count, we'll go to, or, or, Director go um, Leslie Keener is here to answer any questions anyone may have regarding the project. Okay, Council Vice President uh, Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a, a few questions. I bet you can answer them. Um, this contract was a bid at $100,000, and now it's being increased to $575,000. Why was it underbid? Uh, thank you, uh, Council President Lewis and uh, Councilor Grout. So these, this EC is for the Uptown Transit Center Joint Development Partnership Agreement, and it is to re increase the reimbursable, as you just said. Um, this is basically taking the previously approved grant dollars, and it's just formally committing them to Pacific Cap for the pre-development services. So it's going to move the uh, design from conceptual to 30%. Um, this EC from 2019 didn't specify a maximum value for the pre-development services, nor the amount of allocated grant monies, and that is essentially what we are doing here. So by increasing the amount um, to that $575,000, we are fulfilling the RFP provision that calls for all the grant dollars to be applied to this project, um, and also extending the contract period to 1-12-25. Um, that will apply all the allocated FTA grant monies for this project and get us to 30% design, which will then allow us to be able to um, um, submit um, as part of the joint development application, which will give us the necessary application to get our funding for the raise grant as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, so are we going to expect another supplement um, request? Um, Council President and Council Grout, no, this, there will not be another supplement to this agreement. This will allocate all the FTA funds that we have um, for this portion of the project. Okay. Um, and then, um, okay, I think you answered my other question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Councilors. <clears throat> I right, move, move to a vote. This is uh, EC 
Uh, 90, uh, those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes, yes. opposed no. Motion passes. Uh, EC 91, item F, is Mayor's recommendation to award for RFP 2023-458 HRMEV Self-Funded Medical Insurance Administrator Services. I move approval. Motion is second by Councilor Passan. May stand up to speak. Uh, Councilors, any discussion? A question, Council, uh, Vice President Grout. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have questions. No problem. <laughs> okay. Um, how often does the city change insurance providers? Mr. President, Councilor Grout, sorry. I, I was about to answer, and I want to make sure someone answers this accurately. It's every five years, and we can extend if we so choose. And this was a period where we had reached the end of that period. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. So we're at the end of the five years? Okay. Um, why are we changing providers? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Grout, um, the team is here, but I think it's important to note that we um, publicly procure um, our services. We is issued an RFP, and um, we had a procurement team that uh, evaluated all of those responses and uh, went through that competitive process and evaluated and scored them in this way. It's important to note our decision and our goal was to ensure that we expanded the offerings for employees that are in, in uh, uh, receive our um, benefits, use our health benefits. And so that was a big piece of this was ensuring that we gave them some an option. So this time they will have an option as a result of this RFP. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. I have a couple more. Um, will monthly premiums go up? Um, I've also been, another question just to follow up, because um, I have asked about this. Um, what if you want to stay with who we have now? Um, will we be, um, will there be a, a, a problem with that? Will it cost you more? What about, um, will we be in, what, what is that called, in-network providers? You know, those kind of things. So could you kind of go over that for me? Mr. President, Councilor Grout, I'm going to ask our Director of HR, um, Patricia Tafoya Harris, to talk to some of those details um, so that uh, as you get into the details, I want to make sure they're accurate. Mm -hmm. Council President Lewis and Councilor Grout, thank you. My name is Patricia Tafoya Harris, and I'm the Director of Human Resources. I do have a team that I've brought with me as well, um, Tim Rivera, who's my Division Manager of Insurance and Benefits. We want to make sure that we're answering these questions for you. Our intent in these processes is always to have as enhanced of a product benefit offering as we can for our employee population. And so ultimately, um, this process will allow us the ability to begin negotiations with the vendors that have been selected through this RFP process. And as we begin the uh, vendor negotiation process, that'll help us with determining the finalized rates that we will be charging for our employee population. One of the best things about this um, program is it is actually gonna be enhancing the network that we have for our employee population. We'll be able to not only provide the, um, the network through Presbyterian Healthcare Services, but we'll also have the ability to increase our provider network by utilizing um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Network, which will give us access to not only Loveless facilities, but also UNMH. Um, in addition to the local community providers, we will have a very enhanced benefit offering through national um, through the, these two national carriers, the United Healthcare as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield, which will give us the opportunity to have our dependents covered, our employees and our dependents on a very broad national network basis. So employees have the flexibility now of being able to choose the network that they feel most comfortable with and, with, and that uh, will give them choice of utilizing any provider within our local community. Very good. Oh, and I'll also have um, Mr. Tim Rivera talk to you about an employee survey which we conducted uh, that helped us with the de determination. Very good. Mr. President, uh, council members, about eight months ago, we issued a, an employee survey asking our employees to tell us about what their satisfaction was with our benefit offering, the networks that we offered, and we got about a 33% response rate, and of those 33% percent responding, over 45 percent of them uh, said yes, they wanted access to a broader network and more, more benefit offerings. So we, we bore that in mind as we went through the process. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. Um, 
33% responding to a survey is actually very good. Because <laughs> a lot of people don't do that. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and I'm also, if I understand you right, there will be an increase, um, increase in availability of providers, which is really important. That sometimes is a problem these days. So. Mr. President, Council Member, um, I was struck by the, the students from ACE. Um, ACE? ACE. And one of the students talked about access to behavioral health care and how limited it is. Um, that's pretty much the, the case in all of New Mexico for all services. So we really wanted to make sure we were responding to our employees and trying to give them more access. Thank you very now, much. Now, with respect to your question about cost, um, in the healthcare industry, costs never go down. They always go up. It's just a matter of how far up they, they go. Um, on the call today with us is our consultant uh, from Griff Consulting. And if you want to hear more about the cost, we will see a premium increase this coming year, but it'll be a lot less than what it could have been based on the cost mm -hmm. analysis. And, and if you'd like, I, could, I can ask um, our consultant to uh, speak to that for you. Um, I do, so I want to just clarify that we will also still be able to use Presbyterian Healthcare. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Some people, um, changing providers is also stressful. Um, it's, it's a big deal. So I'm glad that there's opportunity, there's choice, that's really important. Um, and if maybe we can just follow up, um, you can just send me an email of what the sure. options might be, costs going up. I'd appreciate that. Mr. President, Council Member, we'd be glad to do that. This result in any other changes to Presbyterian coverage or uh, other than possible? Uh, Mr. President, uh, Council Member, these are our plans. There are no changes to our plans at this okay. point in time. Um, Presbyterian is our current administrator, mm -hmm. and we've asked United and Blue Cross to administer the same plans as is. Um, there's enough of a change coming with the administrator. We didn't want the plans to um, change and uh, impact the employees from that angle as well. Okay, Councilor Bassan. Okay. Councilor, the others, uh, Councilor Rogers. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I, you said there's going to be an increase, and so I'll, I'd like the same information, but are, you know, we're negotiating raises, so are we taking that to, into consideration, the increase, and are we going to be helping our staff with an increase to match this? Mr. President, Council Member Rogers, um, in answer to your question, yes, we are currently working with uh, the administration to determine our premium increase for the year. We're not quite there yet. Our consultant still has a little bit of work to do. And then we have a follow-up meeting with the administration to go over those, those potential increases. All right, Councilors, anything else? All right, th thank you all very much. Appreciate all your thank work. Thank you. Um, it's time to speak. Uh, administration, anything else? All right. We'll go to vote. Those in favor, say yes. This is EC91. Right? Say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Those opposed, no. The motion passes. Um, OC8 is appointment of Andrea Calderon to the Accountability and Government Oversight Committee. Uh, move confirmation. Uh, motion is second by Councilor Rogers. Anyone time to speak on this? Administration? Councilors, any discussion or questions? Mr. President? Uh, Council Vice President Graff. Thank you. Um, I, I really um, believe that committees should have diversity of all kinds, um, from all walks of life, um, from different um, from backgrounds. And then for um, the way we think about things. And so I, it's really important to me. I see um, some of our committees and, and boards and commissions aren't working. Some of them are a little dysfunctional. And so that's what we're finding out and we're hearing from people. Um, and so um, I think it's important that we have, have that uh, different uh, thought process. So um, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Fubicorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Calderon for um, 
even being willing to serve on this board, I just want to remind everyone that she is the Senior Advisor for Healthy Communities at the John Hopkins Center for Government Excellence. And um, I think that right there says it all, that she is qualified for the Accountability and Government um, Committee. But I, I also just want to say that she's been really helpful to my office on a couple of things that I think all the counselors, I, I assume all the counselors support, things like helping us figure out how to get amendments and context available as we move through um, bills through our committee process so that the public can see what we're amending into bills. Um, that is hugely important and, and is going to be really helpful and that came from a meeting with Ms. Calderon. Um, she's also the one that is putting together the budget oversight um, evening for the people of Albuquerque to come and learn about our budgeting system and what is budgeted and how it works. And so, um, you know, this just seems like the perfect person to serve our city um, and share her expertise and knowledge on this important topic. So I just want to thank her for um, her willingness to serve, and I certainly hope we will approve her. Well, she's serving the, I guess, advising the staff and um, along with her role, um, with her position, or? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So she, she and I met, uh, this was a while ago, and one of the things that she mentioned, I asked her what she thought was missing from her expertise at the John Hopkins School of Government Excellence, what was the most important thing for council. And uh, one of the things she pointed out was that we do not have amendments available to people. When uh, we say we go through LUPS and we have an amendment, right now those are not available on our website. And so we've been working um, ever since then with council staff to be able to post those so that people can see what happens in our um, you know, LUPS and in FGO. I think that's going to be hugely important. I know I get a lot of questions about that. And so that was just an idea, one of many ideas that um, Ms. Calderon has shared with us and um, we've been able to start the implementation process on, all based on her work at the Center for Government, Government Excellence. All right, other discussion? All right, Councilors, this OC8 has been moved in and seconded. Uh, those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Uh, those opposed, raise your hand and say no. Uh, mm -hmm. motion, motion fails on a 5-4. Uh, we'll go to OC9. This is the appointment of Robert J. Aragon uh, to the Accountability and Government Oversight Committee. I move confirmation. Okay. A motion is seconded by uh, Vice President Grout. Uh, anyone time to speak on this? All right. Um, uh, Councilor's discussion? Uh, we'll go to vote. This is OC9. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Okay. Those opposed, no. Uh, motion passes on a six to three. Uh, now we're on final actions. Um, item A, Council of Court. Thank you, Mr. President. This is R20, approving and authorizing the application for and use of grant funds for phase two funding under the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, CPRG. Um, the implementation grant and authorizing an appropriation to the General Services Department for fiscal year 2025, and I move a due pass. Second. Uh, motion is R20. It's been, mo been moved and seconded by Council Vice President uh, Grau. Uh, you want time to speak on this? Okay. Uh, Council, any discussion? Uh, uh, Vice President Grau. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank the administration for keeping your commitment to getting these grant applications approved by council before you submit them and they're awarded. So I appreciate that. <laughs> That's yay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's important for us to see that these priorities and the projects city staff are working on. Um, I think there's a lot of good um, projects in here and um, such as the transit oriented development, the rail trail, electrifying our transit system and other city vehicles, increasing the number of DC fast chargers, green stormwater infrastructure projects, uh, funding more tree plantings. Um, our community really likes that. There's a lot more. So this is a massive effort, and I would like to thank everybody that's worked on it. I think it's a good thing, and I, I hope good luck getting it. Thank you. All right, thank you, counselors. Any other discussion? Uh, back to the sponsor. No need for a close after that. Your support. All right, this is R20. It's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Uh, those opposed, no. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Uh, there being no other business, this city council meeting is adjourned. <laughs>